the Camp Baker Show. Good afternoon, good evening, a big, huge, warm welcome to this, the show you have been waiting all week to hear. That's right, it's the Freaky Friday with the Woo Crew ourselves, and tonight, myself, Big Marty, Johnny Whistles, and the one and only Joe Joseph, and we have dug up an amount of headlines tonight that, well, if Woo doesn't cover this kind of stuff, guys, I really don't know what does. But a big thank you to everyone for tuning in tonight. So let's get to the guys involved here. First of all, go to Johnny Whistles. How are you doing, man? Doing fine, Kev. Looking forward to the show and having my brain melted again because, my God, some of the stuff that we go into, Kev, is woo, ultra woo. <laughs> big time. Get the, get the tinfoil ready. And one organisation tonight that I think will be getting taken to the woodshed a couple of times will probably be NASA. There's going to be a bit of CERN tonight, all the kind of stuff that the listeners love. And of course, another person that the listeners love is Big Marty, back with us, full steam ahead tonight. Machine's working for now, Marty boy. Oh, it sure is, and it's good to be back on my actual system. Looking forward to this, guys. And I'd just like to say that my brain is already melted looking at the articles we're going to get into tonight, so it's going to be good. It's absolutely brilliant. It's almost, you know, Joe, as if on a Friday... The yeah. mainstream media and all the alternative media sites, they know it's Freaky Friday. They give us all this ammunition to load the gun with and what stories we have got tonight. Oh, man. I mean, you want to talk. This is your this. We had to go back and do a classic Freaky Friday because next Friday, our special guest is Clifford Carnacom of the Carnacom Institute and the guy that really blew the lid off of chemtrails back in the 90s. So uh, you don't want to miss next week. Uh, the 28th, 7 p.m. Eastern, midnight in the U.K. Man, it's going to be an awesome show, Kev. But Joe, that's pretty big news because this guy, he hasn't done interviews for a long time from what I can remember. The health has uh, been, hasn't been so good. So it's good to see him back in, in action again. Excellent stuff. Now, I'm just logging into the chat room so we can give our listeners a much-deserved shout-out. We've got thousands on the stream right now. And yes. the following Friday, after the Carnicom show, really excited about this one. We're going to have a bit of a world exclusive on the Freaky Friday. Not too exclusive, because they'll be coming on the Kev Baker show beforehand. But our, the one and only Rebecca Roth, she's going to be coming on to talk about her new book, Methodical Deception. And that is going to be on, oh, 5th of August? Is that yeah. about right? 5th of September, Joe? Just sound about right. Sound about right. Well, on you go. <laughs> Let's see. Hold on. I'm gonna, right. I'm gonna look here. Let's see. Now, if we use this here calendar thing, I'm looking at the fourth of September, buddy. Fourth, fifth, Marty. What's a day between friends, eh? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's Freaky Friday, the fourth of September. So, well, no, because I guess for the UK it would be the fifth because it's midnight. You see, I wasn't wrong. It's Freaky Saturday. No, over here. no, no. It's quantum. It's both. <laughs> oh, my God. Ah, Freaky Friday, yes. I'll tell you what, though. There's 63 people in the chat right now, so let me get in there. We've got one fussy git. We've got AI123, Alpha Omega, Art Gloss, Bridgewater, Buzz, Cameron's a Gimp, Catalyze This, Krusty, Dartmoor Dogs, D Fishtail. We've got DJ, Donald, Dr. Blues, Eric, Exit Babylon. Oh, if only we could. We've got Farmer John, Flip Twin, Geodesic, Gergs, Gizmo, Greener, Guest, Iferian, Irish Pete, James Goddard, Jade Helm, Joe, myself, Marty, John Teeter, Lady Totty, Lavender, Laws, Lucky, Major Clanger, we've got Milky Liquor, Mystical Fairy, Nancy, Naughty Boy, Not a Criminal, Penelope, Rally Truther, Reef, Scooby Doo, Smug, Stand Tall, Stushy. Wait a minute, Scooby-Doo, that reminds me. Guys, have you checked out the new Scooby-Doo trailer for the Ooh. Dimensions movie that's coming up? What is up with all this dimensional stuff? It Man, like that's it? not pre-programming, I really do not know. Like <laughs> we'll be talking about that a bit later on. But we've got Stushy, Sabrosa, Summer, Sweeney, Ted Welsh, Texan Terror, We've got the Tinfoil Man, Time Lord, Unscripted, Utah, Vex, Wada Vanons, Meat Dog, Gomez, D 
DHT King and Oliver Max. So there we go, folks. We are ready. We are going to launch into some woo. And today, you know, NASA, right on cue. Why is it they do this to themselves all the time? I don't know how many of you guys out there listening to this live right now caught the selfie that was sent back all the way from the surface of Mars by the Curiosity rover. Now, I'm not usually one to dip my toe into the calling out fake NASA photographs, but come on, guys. Anyone that takes one look at this has to shout shenanigans. And it's so obviously put together and fake, it begs the question as to why. So I'll come to you first, Joe. What's your take on the latest NASA offerings from the surface of Mars? It's awful curious, that's all I could say. Because, from the Curiosity uh, rover, things get very curious. Very curious indeed. Well, let me ask you something. Did you? Would you think you would have considered it fake if you didn't know Photoshop so well? I mean, um, I would have. I mean, would, maybe, you, would, would, would you believe it? Honestly. I don't even think I would, Joe. I'd, it's still something, something doesn't look right about it to me, even without the fact that because I use Photoshop and things, it starts to get a lot easier when you see some of the trickery that's used. Now, I'm not saying that NASA are totally crap with Photoshop, but sometimes they actually are. Yeah, no, they do. They do quite often. But, but I guess my thing is, you know, I don't think that they give enough credit, Marty, to people in general, just how intelligent they are. Now, they may be unplugged, but they're intelligent in a lot of ways. And that's like the fact that so many people know how to do photo editing now and Photoshop. It's almost become commonplace to the point where maybe they think that um, they're getting away with something. But in, in reality, they're not. And now, you know, it's kind of like people are waking up to the fact that maybe some of the stuff NASA does isn't real. What do you think, Marty? Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah, we, we, it's been looked at time and time again with some of the NASA missions to whether it was one big scam just to generate cash and basically fool the masses, especially with the, the first moon landings and stuff. Now, I do believe that they had the capability to go there and they might have went there. It just seems that what they've shown us, that old uh, footage there was a little bit of a, a setup and, and talking about Hollywood and NASA and stuff. There's a, a new film coming out called The Martian starring Matt Damon and Matt Damon himself and director Ridley Scott have uh, just been visiting NASA's, NASA's jet propulsion lab there. So talk about Hollywood. But I can see that when we're talking about Photoshop, you, I think that NASA has probably used that for this photo themselves because if you look at it, I mean, there's no arm really where the you, you should actually be able to see. So they look as if that they've, they've took that out with the... There's a thing on it, Kev, I can't remember that there's, there's a thing and you take something out and it puts in what should be in the background. Yeah, there's a content aware tool. Yeah. Here's one of the other things that gets me with every single photo we look at from Mars. The sky isn't red. It might be in all their photographs, but the atmosphere is actually a lot bluer than what we are ever told. It doesn't even look with that red hue and that red colouring the way that we perceive it. Yeah, it's the red planet, but even the photos that we've been showing of it with that hue change and a change in the saturation of the colour, we don't have any idea what the surface of that planet really looks like at all. Maybe the best idea people would have would be these ast kind of amateur astronomers, Johnny, who actually get a look at it through some high-powered telescopes. But anything coming from these space agencies, I honestly can't blame some of the people for wanting to call out fake every single time because some yeah. of the stuff they offer us, it's just bad. So bad. I just don't <clears throat> see the reason for actually faking this picture, Kev. That's the thing. You don't see the reason for faking it? No, I don't see the reason for faking this picture because, I mean, if you're asking me to do I believe that the Mars rovers are, rovers are up on Mars, then yeah, I do. Yeah, I believe I believe so too, guys. Um, I, I don't know. The big thing with NASA is we know how many lies they tell, and I think people have got to the point now where they really don't know what to believe. It's like the, the I don't know. They, they've kind of lost the credibility. 
And part of me thinks that they don't really want us to see everything that's going up on Mars, uh, going on up on Mars and other planets out there. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're trying to hide something, possibly, Joe. You see, I look at the Indian space program and I see them launching into space for, was it $300 million? Yeah. And you compare that to the billions that NASA say that they're spending. And I think somehow some of that isn't quite going to the programs that it says it's growing. Ah, see, there so you possibly, go. and it's total woo, I know. Mm-hmm. And it's, I'm not saying this is fact, but there's one explanation why they might want to fake kind of pictures coming back from programs because if they've said they've put so much money into it, well, you have to have some kind of payoff, don't you? Exactly. <laughs> I agree with that. But again, that doesn't mean that is fake. It's just one explanation why they would have to fake stuff to justify the billions and sometimes even when you look at the all tallied up, it's probably trillions by now. Oof. Yeah, I think one year or the the previous couple of years, I've seen it around the 18 billion mark. So it's quite up there. Definitely. And, you know, when it goes back to the moon landings, here's another reason why I think they might have faked the initial landing, Marty. And they might even have faked the entire space race because at that time they were really, as we are now, at loggerheads with the Russians and with the Russians already having Sputnik up there and things like that, they had a genuine space program. Now, with America saying, let's have a race, let's go to the moon first, you've seen the Russians pouring every single ruble they had into their space program and not quite getting there. But then again, did America get there? And how much money did they pour in to the space program, really? Was it going off-world? Was it going to black ops? They had all the NASA kind of the Nazi rocket scientists. I think they had this kind of technology perfected way in advance. Yeah, definitely. What do you guys think on this whole situation? Okay, so they went to the moon, no doubt. They went to the moon. If you got to go get a telescope, look at the moon. You you can see the stuff left on the moon if you have a good telescope. Eh, Halfway decent. You buy them at Walmart if you really want to. And you can see it. Stanley so, Kubrick done the film on the moon, Joe. Come on. Well, that, hey, you know what? I bet you they did that too. The oops, we didn't realize that the Van Allen belt was that strong. And oh, it erased our magnetic tapes. Shit. I mean, come on. That's what happens. Sometimes we do, we do mess up. But so the Van Allen that, radiation belt is able to erase the tapes, but not touch the DNA of the guys electro, in there. It's electromagnetic radiation. But they're even saying now that we can't go through there. Come on. Yeah, okay, if you're not shielded. And I know that flies in the face of my secret space program. Uh, yeah, like, like Joe said, though, if you're not shielded. I know we, we've brought up a couple of weeks ago on the Freaky Friday show about this new shield that they've brought out to actually mm-hmm. get through that and beyond where man's not supposed to be able to go because of all the harmful space radiation and stuff. So they've already well, got they, technology. Yeah, they got shielding, right, Marty? I mean, come on. It, it, look, they're opening up interdimensional portals, Kev. If we well, can't why do you need shielding then? Exactly. <laughs> why do you need shielding? I, I can't figure it out either. But okay, let's just say they're like everybody's fixated on Star Trek, right? Well, then you're going to need some shielding. And then you just use the whole warp nacelles that warp the space time. Basically, I guess those are particle accelerators, right? I, I guess that's what they would be to bend space. And, and there you go. Pew, there you go. Warp speed. You can do it that way. Or we can just do it the old fashioned way. Just open the Stargate and go from point A to point B. What do you say? That's what Scooby-Doo's doing. (laughs) That's what Scooby's doing. Exactly. Scooby's doing it. Terminator did it. Come on. We can do it. And Terminator went back in time. Oh, and so so, same in in Rewind, too. Remember Rewind? Ooh, that was freaky. But, but, you know, that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with. So to say that that we can't get through the radio the Van Allen radiation belt, or we didn't have the technology. Come on. You know, Tesla was, had figured out basically what everything. I mean, that guy was one gifted guy and he came up with all of these different, and basically was the the pioneer, this type of technology or one of them. And and that was over a hundred years ago. So even 50 years later to say that we can't, not only get through it, but utilize that kind of stuff? Come on. It's naive. 
Now, the people don't have that technology, you know, but you're telling me the military doesn't? You're telling me that the clandestine operations don't and that that doesn't trickle down? I mean, come on. It, it, the, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Do you, but, but, Joe, do you know, thinking in that time, for the time that there was supposed to be man on the moon until now, do you not think that we'd have progressed from the moon to Mars a lot quicker than what maybe, we're doing just now? Maybe they, maybe they figured out a way that they don't need to go that way. Well, maybe. Andrew Bisaggio, he says that as well as having temporal access, they did have a jump room that went to a base on Mars. Now you can take it or leave it, but he testifies yeah. to that. And then you've also got mm-hmm. other whistleblowers who are coming forward to say that they worked on a Mars mining colony. Now, that becomes really relevant for me because just in recent weeks, we've been covering HR 1508, the Space Mm -hmm. Exploration Act, which basically lays out the legal framework for corporations to go and mine and take over space, basically. And yet we're told we're 20, 30 years away from doing that in reality. So why the rush to get the legal framework put in place now? I think there's a whole lot more going on that we're not privy to. And today in an article I put out about the NASA picture, I said sometimes it's almost as if when they muddy the waters this much, and we've seen some of the pictures that come back with them, so-called artefacts found up on Mars and spacemen seen on Mars and things like that, some of it's that ridiculous. It makes me think they're trying to make it so ridiculous it turns people away. And if they're turning people away from it, well, that means they must have something to hide, would it not? Oh, I believe so. I mean, if you look at the tether incident and uh, other footage similar to it, all the things you can see out there in space, and they never tell us about any of it. So I, I really do have to agree with you, Kev. I think there's a bit of disinformation going on when it comes to NASA, and it's probably on purpose, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and- it's all, You know what, Kev? It's, it's almost like um, it's a dog and pony, right? It's a dog and pony out there that distracts people with pictures of Pluto and everything else. But in the background, the technology is that much more advanced. It's just very few have access to it. Definitely. And talking of advanced technology, guys, you are going to love this and so are the audience. But let's, for the purposes of Freaky Friday, go with the International Space Station being real. Okay. Now, some mm-hmm. of the footage that they captured just in recent days, somebody has put up on the web. And this alleges to show what some believe may well be, wait for it, the Black Knight satellite. Get if you're out. talking about technology, Joe, I give you some ancient technology and some woo. And I'm going to go and dig up that link right now. I'll share it in the chat room and everyone can look for themselves. But it looks very similar to the pictures that have been on the web for years when it comes to the Black Knight. And, well, is it, isn't it? And it has, begs the question, who the hell put that there? Well, that's, a, that's a very good question. We don't know. You know, maybe it was a pre-flood. You know, maybe it was the the fallen ones. Maybe it was an alien race. Maybe there was a race on Earth before we got here. I don't know. But why maybe, hide it? Maybe it's the original Ark. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, it's, it's a fascinating thing. M- my thing is, how do we know it is what it is? First of all, you know, I, I do know that it's up there. They've seen it. Oh, there it is. Okay, I've got it. And it was putting out some sort of signal for a long time. I think it may still be. A Scottish guy decoded it. It was coming from Ellen and Butis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, right, or something like that, right? Just very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it had to and be a Scotsman, didn't it? It had to be a Scotsman for that. But um, I guess you have to hide it. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Why would they hide something like that? Well, it kind of messes, it up, up, messes up their timeline, does it not, Joe? If this is like a 13,000, 15,000 year old satellite that's in I, a I guess it would. I mean, polar it, orbit that we didn't do until when? 40s, 50s, 60s? I don't know. Uh, it's, <sighs> it's a tough one, man. I, I know. But I mean, the Black Knight satellite is, is definitely a mystery. 
that no one's talking about. But but there were I, was it like a Life magazine or Time magazine did an article on it. Yeah, back can in I have the- to go over it quickly because there are people in the chat asking what is the black satellite? What are we talking about? So Joe, quick recap on what this is because the first time I heard about it, it absolutely knocked me off my chair. <laughs> the Black Knight satellite is one of those satellites that you just you know, it's it's a thing that. I mean, how how do we explain it? It almost looks like scrap metal in space. It well, hang on, Marty's got the wiki there. What's the wiki say? Let's see what Wookie says about it. Marty, tell us. Yeah. Well, the the story of the Black Knight satellite origins go back to 1954 when some newspapers over in St. Louis and then also the San Francisco Examiner ran stories talking about this um, uh, retired naval aviation major and he was also a, a UFO researcher. And he, he was basically saying that the U.S. Air Force had reported that two satellites orbit in the Earth had been detected. But actually, at that time, nobody had the technology to even launch a satellite. So that's kind of where it started. And it was featured in the 1960s in Time magazine and uh, various other uh, features over the years previous. So it's, it's been going for some time. What if that's been left here to keep us under some kind of mind control, guys? What if that's given off some kind of frequency? We say we're on a prison planet. Maybe we are actually on a prison planet, but the bars are frequency radio waves. Maybe we should shoot the thing down. Not think, Joe? Well, <laughs> that would be the human thing to do now, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what we do. We blow it's shit up. It's the soldier in me. Just shoot it. <laughs> well, to say that they didn't have the technology to launch them at that time, maybe it was some sort of Black Ops satellite and they didn't want to release it. They even had it at the time, so they had to uh-huh. and muddy the waters kind of thing. Just a theory. Yeah, but the, the thing is that we couldn't do a polar orbit, Marty, until years and years after that. Maybe, maybe it's the remnants of Nimrod's Tower of Babel. Oh, the remnants of Nimrod's Tower of Babel. Well, they did say he was trying to reach into the heavens to speak to God, didn't they? Uh, I mean, if he launched a satellite, I guess, uh, you know. And people thinking you can't launch satellites back then, well, you have to go and look at the kind of Vedic texts and thing called Vermanas. If these Mm. things aren't spaceships, I really don't know. And you can even see them in the architecture of the temples over in Asia. They're actually built in the shape of the flying machines that brought down their ancient gods. Go figure. Isn't that interesting? And even in medieval times, uh, what was it? The Hare Krishnas? Um, If you look at some of their ancient uh, pictures and you go to their temple, it was like one of the oldest standing churches on earth is in India. And, um, or wherever it was, I can't remember where it was, but they had a, a, a illustrations of like these battles with you with flying saucers and almost um geez they almost look like uh the, those uh, fighters from Battlestar Galactica i mean that <laughs> makes me think of that painting is at nuremberg where it shows you back in oh, hundreds of years ago flying machines having a war in space above the town i mean and surely you, there wasn't yeah. people like conspiracy theorists, X-File guys like us kicking about back then, was there? No, I mean, come on, dude. It, you, uh, they try but, to bury this so much and make it a fairy tale. But the fact is, it's just not. And when you go to sites uh, that are off limits, like, for example, Marty, Mount Sinai, you can't get onto Mount Sinai or to the actual Mount Sinai because the Saudi Arabian government has it fenced off under penalty of um, uh, jail time. And you don't want to go to Saudi Arabian jail. And um, possible uh, death, they might even kill you. I mean, why not just let people go investigate it? What do you think, Marty? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's supposed to be a free world. Bit of an understatement there. But definitely, I just wanted to throw a bit of woo in there before the break because it is Freaky Friday. But maybe to explain some of these incidences or some of this uh, ancient technology and stuff that we can't still work out to this day. A lot of the stuff that's been found and dug up and archaeologists have uh, documented and stuff. Maybe, just maybe, in a quantum universe, some time travellers could have gone back to ancient Egypt or around that time 
and um, just, you know, directed society the way they wanted it to. Ah, now you're talking oh. my language, Big Marty, oh. because we've even got time travellers coming back and throwing the spanner in the works at CERN, or at least that's what some of the scientists were alleging in 2012. And I wonder, guys, could that happen? Is there, like, kind of time travelling shenanigans going on where they're putting artefacts out of place or kind of misleading us and stealing the good stuff? Yeah, but where are the bad guys? Where the where are the bad guys that go and take over the planet and destroy everything and kill people's Joe, family lines off? Joe, where, where, what? In, Joe, they're on the Fox debate and they're in Parliament and they're running the country. I know, but I'm I'm just saying, like, if they want to change something, or uh, the possibilities are endless. I guess so. That there, I I just can't I can't do it. Can't do it. Is it a bit woo the, too far for you, Joe? No, no, but I mean, it's a good story. It is. It's a good story. <laughs> Listen, folks, we are right hard up on the break, and I tell you what, that is one wooful start to a Freaky Friday. And do you think it can't get any more woo than that? Oh, stay tuned. Join us on the other side. You're listening to the Truth Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no no, no fear. Welcome back to the second half of, well, the second segment of Freaky Friday. We are here with you live for the next two and a half hours right here on www.truthfrequencyradio.com. Now, we were going into some deep space woo before the break, and we're going to keep it going on this side of the break because just before the show, I found an article over on CNN, and the headline reads like something out of the Freaky Friday script book, is there life on Jupiter's moons? Juice may... Juice may hold the key. And you know, it says here, could the mysterious moons of Jupiter be hiding habitable zones under their icy crusts? The Rosetta mission's startling discovery that Comet 67P contains multiple organic compounds that make up the building blocks of life adds weight to a theory that Earth may have been seeded by those vital ingredients. So, guys, what do we think? Life on I moons around think Jupiter? So. <laughs> what was that, Joe? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh. Nah. Well, Sorry. They, Sorry. They, they, or, or let me just say. Denied. No, not. not mm-mm. No. Uh, have they got this story from the Jupiter Ascending movie? <laughs> they may have. Uh, may, you know. I, I think you might find that at the Sitchin Cafe on the moon. So you're not buying that there's organic compounds on this comet? Oh, maybe. Absolutely, sure. There's organic compounds. So what that's, part aren't you buying about this story, Joseph? No, that's okay, but that's all they are, okay? That's it. So you're start- not saying that this kind of theory of panspermia has got any weight at all? No. No. Because no, take a look at if... If things were different by just how much of a percent could life exist on this planet? Well, I think no. we, we only differ something like 1% from chimpanzees and, well, a bit of a difference going on there, is there not? <laughs> not really. No, no. Or the pig. We're very close to the pig, too. Yeah. But you would the, have me believe, Joseph, that a guy somewhere or a being somewhere created us out of the out of well nothing he he spoke he spoke us into existence he spoke us into existence mm-hmm. from monkeys and pigs <laughs> couldn't, couldn't you couldn't you do it like on the holiday and, and you say my couldn't theory's speak- wild well <laughs> if you were on the holodeck right could you not speak things at computer you know come on uh, ma- manifest a woodland forest please there it is. I just spoke it into existence. I'm just saying. Does yeah, that make you a god, though? Say, the universe, as you say, is a hologram, right? Oh, I so, definitely, I'm definitely there, yeah. Okay, so if it's a hologram, the holodeck ain't too far off, right? I'm just saying. You can speak things into existence. Even from a scientific standpoint, it fits. 
I'm busting your balls, man. You know that. I know you, but I'm just telling you. I think from a vibrational think... point of view, and we all accept by this point, at least the panel here, everything's vibration, electrical and, energy, just and frequencies and stuff like that. Frequency. Then it obviously makes sense that's speaking it into existence. Yeah, cool. That fits. Yeah. Go ahead, Marty. Yeah, just just back to that article sort of thing. I, I kind of think wherever there's energy, there's probably life. So I got to kind of agree. I, I think there's life out there on all these planets, whether it's in the form of certain organisms, maybe not actual beings, but there's definitely something out there. And who knows, the further you go, there'll be other planets just like this. I'll take it one step further, Marty boy, because I like that theory. But I would even say the planets themselves have got some kind of sentient qualities I know that sounds out there and new agey, but the Earth itself, look at the energies it has with the ley line grid that surrounds it. And let's just take a listen to the sounds of Comet 67P. That there was recorded by the Rosetta mission when it was approaching before the Philly lander landed on it and went to sleep. Remember that story? Now, for me, when I hear noises like that, I'm going to go kind of science-y, but possibly it's some kind of effect from the electric universe, that kind of charged rock flying through a electrified space. Surely there's going to be some kind of reverberations, interactions, kind of noise, possibly. But that's just my take on it. What do you think, guys? Yeah, there's different there's different theories on it. I've seen one saying that it could be the solar wind actually interacting with the particles of ionized gas and, you know, in turn acting like radio waves being distorted. Yeah. It definitely leaves you to believe something, definitely. But again, there's energy coming from it, which is frequency and everything else part of the whole system. Exactly. Everything's energy. And that begs the question, Joe, then if we're all energy and we're just kicking about in these biological kind of avatars, and sorry, Johnny, I see you want in there, man, but I'll just finish this off. Then when this kind of avatar, this spacesuit dies off, where does that energy go to then, Joe? Hmm. That's a good question. I guess uh, we can have all the theories we want. No one knows the truth. I don't know the truth. I have no idea. Oh, by the way, I have my own probe that um, actually got, I don't know, received a transmission. Do you want to hear it? Of course, Ooh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. See, I told you, man, I, I got, <laughs> and I copyrighted you to boot. <laughs> now I've got to go in there and dig that clip out before all the people who can't make it live to the show can enjoy it on YouTube, Joe. Thank you very, very much, man. Yeah, so, so, yeah, I mean, how do you know that came from that comet? Just out of curiosity. You know, oh, Joe, now we, we get into the trust know. thing. Now we, we get into the trust thing. That's what I was going to say. We can't know, but. My take, and people will think, well, Kev, sometimes you're saying everything's fake. Then there's other times there's UFOs, there's secret space. Well, there's a there's a whole heap of everything going on at once. There's a parallel space program, in my opinion. Now, that was ESA that put that out, Marty. That was the European Space Agency. And they're exactly the same as NASA. Just to say, you so say potato, it, I say potato. Exactly. So it probably is a whole heap of baloney. Yeah, but, but at the would, same time, I do believe there's so much going on out there that they don't there tell is, us about. No doubt, dude. Even the look, the Bible talks about that that there's um, um, terrestrial bodies and celestial bodies, and that there is other life out there. Okay, so look, do you think they want to come down? And let's be real: Would you want to come to Earth and, and be like, "Hey, Earthlings"? We're here. And what's going to happen? Dude, they're going to blow. We're going to blow them up because that's what we do. We break things and we blow shit up. That's what we do. That's what humans do. Probably the most hostile planet in the, well, in this universe. <laughs> Good grief, man. I mean, we're like the reality TV show on steroids for the universe. That's all I'm saying. I mean, Johnny Whistles. No. Uh, do you know that nobody ever talks about the farting aliens on Mars? 
Uh, no, there is the Spartan aliens on Mars because Good there's point. these there's these big giant holes in Mars, and they know that there's loads of methane coming from these. So they're definitely farting a lot. You can't see them, but they know they're there. <laughs> Did you just say methane? Yes. Uh, see, we, that's not how we say it over in America, man. We say methane over here. See. No, we say methane. Aluminium. Aluminium. You thought you thought all weird over <laughs> yeah, there. Aluminium. Like, aluminium. <laughs> I mean, come on. What's the aluminium? It sounds like you guys are from Mars. Because we are from Mars. Do you what think? Do you we're, well, here's the question. Then. Hey, the War of the Worlds. Remember that? Remember right. that radio show? This that isn't going to fit with your mindset, Joe. So I'll ask Marty and Whistles this one: <laughs> Is there a chance that we came from? Mars, because we do see some evidence, or at least we could say it suggests there may be the likes of pyramids up there at the site of Sidonia. Like Johnny says, there's traces of methane. We're now finding out. Methane. I mean, when I was growing out, when I was growing up, there was never any talk of water on any other planet apart from Earth. But now it's quite commonly accepted that, yeah, Mars has got pockets of ice and water. So if there's water, We've got the remnants of maybe old ruins. You got Was the Battlestar Galactica. Oh, this is why I cut you out of this question, <laughs> Joe. Absolutely cut you out of it. Marty boy, Just... bring some sense to it. Yeah, like you said, recently confirming ice and stuff like that. And we've seen it in movies for years, Total Recall. There's, there's always been some sort of theory about Mars and how it actually could have been um, a normal functioning planet just like this one and then there was some kind of nuclear disaster or something went wrong the atmosphere got all messed up and uh, they're actually talking now with this whole Mars One project and people going over to live there within the next 10 years big big stuff happening a lot of money being put into Mars at the minute they're actually talking of maybe trying to restart Mars's atmosphere over time to actually populate it and get it back to how it was so uh, definitely I, I think that that is a very strong possibility. There could have been a, a boom in civilization on there, and then we came down in our fiery ships. That's why you've got all the hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt showing flying crafts and things that look like helicopters when they didn't have stuff like that, did they? And you know what makes me laugh, Marty? When they talk about going out and making these worlds, be it Mars or some other exoplanet they come across, more habitable, the first thing they say they will do is they will change the atmosphere via, via aerosols. But surely that's the very thing they deny doing down here on this planet. Chemtrails and things like that, they don't exist. But when it comes to out in space, oh, it's given that we can do that. Snowpiercer, Joe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, but, well, you but, went there. The Friday Snowpiercer reference. Okay, <laughs> so mark that time, Kev. Mark that time. <laughs> at least Kev, I don't have to you, cut that out go Johnny Kev, Kev do you think then if if that's the case at Mars uh, we were there before coming here what kind of atmosphere would Mars have knowing that what we get bombarded with do you know what I mean on a daily basis and our uh, magnetic shield is um, hits weakening at a fast rate so I wonder what kind of atmosphere Mars must have had being so close. Good point, Johnny, good point. And, you know, maybe, just maybe, it's a case of these cycles, and if you don't learn from history and real ancient history, we're doomed to repeat it. Possibly, right, we started going nuclear up on Mars. Maybe we had some kind of giant war. We absolutely trashed the planet. Maybe we had some kind of genetic memory of that when Oppenheimer <laughs> warned that we might set fire to the atmosphere and things. But then here we are today now, maybe back in the 40s when we started hearing about these UFOs turning up, trying to warn us to stay away from nuclear, truly is our future selves. And they do see the big picture that we're about to repeat history. Oh, some woo, Joe. Can you go there? Hey, man. <laughs> let, me, let me just say this. Have we not proven time and time again how secular or cyclical, cyclical in nat nature we are, human beings? And how we always repeat the same mistakes time and time again. I mean, if, if we can't see that, then yeah. If, if, look, I, I personally, me, it's not that I, I don't, I couldn't believe something like that. I just don't care. That, 
I just, I just don't care. See, I'm one of these guys that wants to be up there, man, on the holodeck. Okay, I want to be on the holodeck, but I don't give a crap if we came from Mars or not. I mean, I, I don't. Uh, the problem's here now. They're opening portals here now. Who, Mars? Really? I mean, all right. I just don't. I, I don't want to go out in the atmosphere and have my eyeballs pop out and my face like explode. <laughs> a la, a la Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. But seriously, does it matter at this point? To to me, I don't think it matters. Okay, we can go and look at Mars and say, yeah, there's pyramids there and all that kind of stuff. But we're interested in the pyramids here, so really, we should say, ah, well, it doesn't really matter then. But no, if if that's the case, I would I would more so believe in the whole Planet X thing. In you know, here comes here comes a, a brown dwarf, boom, smashes into that Tiamat planet, knocks things all around, knocks things out of orbit. You know, I, I would I would more so go with that before I go with humans went nuked the crap out of Mars, destroyed it, and then came here. It, it's plausible considering our behavior, because that's what we do. But I'm uh, just saying it's a little. Hmm. I, I like the Battlestar Galactica thing. I really oh, do. I that's, love that. I, that's oh, why I brought it up. That's why I brought. Okay, so so here we go. We create AI, and uh, the AI comes back and nukes the crap out of us, and then we run away. And we go to another ga galaxy or another solar system, and we go there, and it's all over again. Here we are. That's interesting. Just saying. And then that new star system, hundreds and thousands of years in the future, they've got a kind of mythological story that the kids have been told over the ages about a place called Earth. And then they finally go out and they start exploring all the stars. And they, they, find, it, they find Earth... And you think to yourself, wow, absolutely fantastic. They arrive on Earth. They come down to Africa. They're sitting down in African plains, and you're thinking, what's going to happen next? And then they see an ape coming along. And they're looking at the ape, and they say, you know what? We could probably genetically engineer that to look like us in our image. And so it began. <laughs> Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I had to go there, Joe. Oh well, hey, I've I've got something for you when it comes to that, Mister. You know, a story a story like that definitely deserves the. But I, I thought we were getting the f close encounters of the third kind music there, dude. I was ready to start speaking. Oh, home. I'm sorry. coming down yes creating us in the image come on really <laughs> or, or pardon me come on really <laughs> <laughs> like Don't i said go. now you could make a fortune make a fortune in the uh in, i'm sure as a, as a novel writer you know? <laughs> probably the, you could Tolkien hear the stuff that i you, don't dude. come out with joe honestly jr Tolkien just can't it, i'm sorry you, you got him just dead to rights, dude. I sometimes wonder whether I should, whether I should do a separate fictional show. <laughs> so what would your pen name be? Um, I.P. Squint. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, I got one since we're talking about aliens. So according to, um, you know, we brought up NASA earlier. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, remember? Yes, we did. Yeah. Well, we didn't. We didn't bring up Edgar Mitchell on the show. I need. I, I need to bring that up. Apollo fourteen astronaut, right? He says he was aware of many UFO visits to Earth during his career with NASA, but each one was covered up. He said this during a radio interview uh, that sources at the space agency, who had contact with aliens, described the beings as little people who look strange to us. This is uh, on uh, TFR, saying aliens stop nuclear war, says astronaut Edgar Mitchell. Just to give you a little validation that they interceded. He said, uh, supposedly real-life ETs were similar to the traditional image of the small frame, large eye, and head. Chillingly, he claimed our technology is, quote, 
not nearly as sophisticated as theirs, and, quote, had they been hostile, he warned, we would have been uh, gone by now. Dr. Mitchell, along with the Apollo 14 commander, Alan Shepard, hold the record for the longest ever moonwalk at nine hours and 17 minutes following the near 1971 mission. Dr. Mitchell also stated, quote, I have, uh, I have to have been privileged enough to be in on the fact that we've been visited on this planet and that the UFO phenomenon is real. It's been well covered up by all our governments for the last 60 years or so, but slowly it's leaked out and some of us have been privileged to have been briefed on some of it. He says, I've been in military intelligence circles who know that beneath the surface of what has been public knowledge, yes, we have been visited. Read, in, read the papers recently. It's happened quite a bit. Now, this is Dr. Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. This is what gets me, Joe. People say, when's disclosure coming? It's happening all around it's a, us. It's Some already happened. Like that. And we've got people like Paul Hellier, who was the ex-defense minister in Canada, an ex-defense minister, no less. And he testifies to, uh, testified to one of the disclosure conferences about the fact that we do have aliens visiting us in craft. Now, I know there's a story that Eisenhower may have met with these beings at some stage. And you know what? I actually think there might be some credence to that, whether it was a swap of technology. I do not know. But, you know, I've thought about this a lot. Surprise, surprise. And we're talking about aliens turning up and things like that. I honestly don't think they would turn up and invade us the way that we would think. I think they would probably try and invade us genetically, try and oh, change us come from down and just start within. Raping left yeah. and right, right. The thing is, if they're able to transverse transverse all that, you know, all those star systems and that vast amount of space, then they've definitely surpassed us in terms of technology. So, like Alien you said, rape. they have other ways of doing things. Definitely, exactly, and they've got to be signed up to the Prime Directive, and they can't use war. <laughs> wow, dude. Okay, so that's book two. I'm writing this down <laughs> right now. No, okay. but I think really, if there is such a thing as like civilizations out there and galactic federations for lack of a better term guys just you give it that name just now the and i think they've come way beyond throwing sticks and stones at weapons at one another i really do that's not to say that maybe in some parts of the universe it's very hostile i'm not saying that but i think if we are to come across some race that does turn up here they're going to be far more evolved advanced and possibly ethically and morally advanced from us as well. Or they can just come and, like you say, want to harvest the planet and uh, and destroy everybody. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the flip side, you know. Yeah, I think both of you are right there, and I think the possibilities are endless. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Here, here's my thing, right? So so I almost... I, I kind of agree with you. I, I'm kind of like... Um, I'm, in, I'm in between. I, what if they did come to Earth, right? This is book three. What if they did come to Earth and they did have that meeting with Nixon and they said, hey, man, look, this is how it works. This is how everything happens. But what we need you to do is we need you to engineer this planet so that we can come down. Because right now it's not, it's not hospitable for us. And um, we're going to do what you just said, Kev, but the way we do it is you aerosol for a number of years and or whatever, it, inject these vaccines, all this kind of stuff. It manipulates the DNA and it makes people vessels for us to inhabit. Exactly. Turns us into the perfect host. Couldn't yep. have put it better, Joe. Yeah, that's book three. Uh, and there's no sequel to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's end game. You know, that, and, and yeah. We're going to talk about this a little bit later, you know, the whole September thing. A lot of people are like, well, that's end game. Oh, the crash is coming. Blah, 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 blah. Look at who cares about it. And we've got a big segment on CERN coming up, which ties yes. into all of this as well, because this is yeah. opening the interdimensional doorways for said beings to come here, possibly, just possibly. Yeah, you know what, man? I'm telling you, we are real close to that. We just are. You just know we can't you feel it? Well, even UNICEF are trying to prepare us, guys. UNICEF, of all people, get a load oh. of this. 
Now, first of all, it was Sonia Van Gelder sent me this, and then Nano Girl sent me it as well. And then last night, Clyde Lewis was covering it. And that's the fact that UNICEF have got an advert out, and it's all about aliens integrating into society. Now, obviously, it's talking about people from different areas, immigration, stuff like that, right? But they have used a wide-eyed alien in the advert. Now, this has set the conspiracy sites that I go to, funnily enough, alight, because we talk about pre-programming all the time, and with all of us saying that there's definitely a push on more space news, stuff like that, Pope talking, aliens, now we've even got UNICEF putting it out there, alien beings. And I know, I know deep down this advert is to portray something else. However, everything's orchestrated, guys. And when it comes from the likes of UNICEF, we really need to take note, and I'll drop that link in the chat for everyone out there. Wow. UNICEF. Unbelievable that they're pushing this kind of garbage. Mm. But I, I mean, I guess you know, UNICEF, Kev. Uh, That's what you UNICEF. Meant. Yeah, exactly. Like Major well, traffickers seen and children, Johnny Whistles. Yeah, I've yeah, seen that. I've seen that advert, Kevin. It's really freaky when you when you think of it. And John, I mean, Sick. you know what they're trying to get at, like yeah. the fact we call them illegal aliens, stuff like mm-hmm. that. I see that. It's a metaphor, yeah. But at right. the same time, <laughs> they don't do anything by chance, guys. No, no, they don't. No, they don't. And <laughs> wow, one hour done. Oh, hour this has been months. epic. I know, our two are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome back. Or two? <laughs> what? I, I thought, what? What do you? What? I thought it was me doing that, man. I. Oh, wow, dude. Well, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Let's this start. guy taught me everything hey, hold, I hold know, on. by wait, the wait, way. Wait. I got this. I got this covered. Hold on. Welcome back. It's hour number two of Freaky Friday, everybody, here on Truth Frequency Radio, truthfrequencyradio.com. <clears throat> Flawless, Joe. Brilliant. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, we just can't have that. So, just to now get that, us straight, now, though, are we on the same timeline, or did that jump take us onto a separate timeline? And we collapsed actually, I the think old our one. timelines co- intersected for a second, and that's kind of why we got all boogered up. But oh, man, you don't want to cross timelines. You, you never heard what happens when you cross timelines, Joe? Bad things, man. Oh, Bad wow. Thing. The woo just gets off the charts. Speaking of woo, let, let's, let's go. Let's just get in a little health food woo, okay? So everybody knows that health food out there for the most part, mm, I mean, I'm all for eating healthy, and I have been lately. I've lost uh, 32 pounds so far. That's right. And, no, you uh, have. You look like Angie's starving you. You okay, man? Do you need me to come I, and get you? <laughs> no, no. It's just, you know what I did, dude? I'll be honest with you. I just cut out eating late. And, um, uh, instead of snacking on junk, uh, I'm eating like, uh, you know, like vegetables and fruit. That's it. That's I'm, one all I these, did. I'm one of these little weirdos that could eat and eat and eat and just can't put weight on, man. Even the arm tries to, to fatten point. me up and it doesn't happen. It Thank happens you. to me to a point, to a point, you know, but it, the point is I'm rather round when that happens. So yeah, but it, there's a point where I top out too. The, the, the problem is though, a lot of the health food that's out there kind of t- tastes like crap, no matter how you slice it. Well, somebody has come up with bacon flavored health food. Yes, that time is here because, come on, man, let's be honest. Everybody likes bacon, right? Depending on your religious beliefs. But even so, <laughs> I'm sure if they got a taste of bacon, they'd be like, oh, this is good. This is real good, right? Okay, so according to live science, there's bacon flavored seaweed. <laughs> it's, not, it's not seaweed, then, is it? It's just bacon flavored something. <laughs> seaweed would be seaweed flavored. <laughs> saying there's seaweed flavored bacon. <laughs> no. <laughs> but anyway, so so yeah, bacon flavored seaweed. They say it's the new kale. Yes, really. Neither Scientists are currently. They're currently cultivating a marine plant that's packed with more nutrients than the trendy green superfood kale. And it naturally tastes like bacon. It just tastes like bacon. 
It is a seaweed that tastes like bacon. So now you can have bacon flavored crackers. It's just crackers. bacon that looks like seaweed then. <laughs> no, it's seaweed that tastes like bacon naturally. Ugh. Nah, I'm not having any of that. No, chill. it's actually something that tastes like bacon that looks like seaweed, but it's really something else. Okay, but now... It feels now, like yoga, Matt. Okay, so... <laughs> but I was gonna, Now, everybody who's been swim in the ocean or anything like that, you know what seaweed feels like, right? It's like snot almost, like green snot. So, bacon-flavored snot? Is that... I mean, that's kind of like... I, that's how I... Mm, no. But they say, you know, they'll make bacon-flavored crackers out of it and bacon-flavored salad dressing. These are just two savory treats that have been created so far by using... A domesticated, <clears throat> I mean, GMO strain of of dulce, uh, palmaria palmata, a kind of red algae or seaweed. Oh, so now they're making us eat the red algae <laughs> that, that shows up in the summertime. Oh, that's good. And by the way, special bonus, it tastes like bacon. So now this pollution that, it, well, it's actually, it, it chokes out all the oxygen in the ocean. Ocean, right around like say the gulf of uh, the mexico or the mississippi river right there uh that's a place where you commonly see the red algae pop up but now we can kill two birds with one stone you can eat healthy and you can do the environment of flavor or favor by eating your bacon flavored seaweed crackers mm. you can have mine joe no thanks <laughs> did you do a smoked so bacon version <laughs> a smoked bacon mm, i don't know I, I don't it, know. It's not, it, see, so, I've got another. We can protect these things, Joe, as well, because all we need to do is just pour thousands and thousands and thousands, in fact, millions of small black plastic balls. And, and, <laughs> and for all you people out there that uh, shop at, um, what is it? Uh, what's it? The Whole Foods. Yeah. It's $90 a pound, this stuff. <laughs> so guess what? It's right in your price range if you if you shop at Whole Foods. Joe, I'd <laughs> rather have ten days worth of sustramen than touch anything, anything I, like you just I described still, there. I am still waiting for you to do the Sir Stramen cha as challenge on your YouTube channel. Would you like me to do that just for laughs? <laughs> I would think you, that would I'm be. sure there's forty five thousand people out there would love to see me doing that. Vomit my head off. I, you know what, man? I'll bet you. I'll bet you. That that would get easily half a million views. Oh, probably. It would be a good experiment to see because you know to to put that up against actual content to Kev opening a can of Sir Stramen and puking his guts out. We could put scary music to it, and then we could like pretend it's me getting exercised because there'll be demons flying out of me the minute I smell that stuff, Joe. Oh, and we can like put in frames at random intervals, very quick. What subliminally? Yeah, yeah, like subliminal pictures of fuzzy kittens. What I, was, do you think? I, I was thinking we would try and trick people into thinking I'm Illuminati and we'll fire in a couple of pyramids and eyeballs in there. I thought everybody thought that already, though. Well, yeah. you see, you see, right? Because I know not all of my subscribers on YouTube tune in to listen to the show and they don't even watch all the shows back. So I can say this quite, quite happily because I know you guys, these are all like family. And I have a bit of a laugh when I'm making the pictures for the YouTubes because I've taken to putting a demonic eye up in the left-hand corner. And I know it's going to annoy some people out there. And that's why I've done it, Joe. I'm bad, isn't I? <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and now every now you just put it in people's heads, right? That, ooh, maybe that's what they're doing too and they're just getting a good laugh. That's cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Oh, oh are you are you not impressed with me, Joe? Do you want me to stop doing it, man? No, no, that's all good. <laughs> no, just keep going. No, no problem. I'm trying By to the use way, their magic against them. I'm taking the voodoo that they do do, and I'm working well, speak, my juju. <laughs> speaking of <laughs> voodoo and magic, um, there was a Kentucky man that tried to dig up his dead dad uh, so he could go to heaven. Just, just so you know, that just happened too. If you want to talk like magic and stuff, Michael Day May of Somerset, Kentucky. Uh, yeah, tried to dig up his dad who was buried in 1978. Uh, well, necromancy is a really, really real thing, Joe. I know, but but I guess my thing is, is uh, 
he 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 really truly believes that this is that's what he wants to do. Now question. Should he be able to? Hmm. Well this kind of takes me back to when I was talking about it just being a space suit. I think the energy that was his dad or whatever has probably gone to a better place right now. And he's misdirecting his love at basically a old carcass. I know that sounds horrible, but it was just a vessel. If we live in a hologram, right? If the universe is a hologram, if we're all a hologram, really, if you think about it, then when you die, would it not be like a, I don't know, a computer algorithm or a computer program just going dormant? And then, you know, like when, when you read in the, the, the Bible says about, you know, the resurrection, is that him not just bringing, just hitting the, okay, let's bring back uh, Joe Joseph right there. Okay, hit the enter button. Boop. Well, I like, I like this. I like this, Joe, because let's take you know? it a step further and say maybe we're all just random strings of code. And then every so often, because we're up to seven billion of us right now, well, we get yeah. kind of replicants or doppelgangers. -ish. Doppelgangers, yes. Exactly. And that's possibly why we see people that resemble ourselves totally unconnected to us in random parts of the world. Maybe it's just a glitch in the code or a recurrence in the code. A ghost in the machine. Two whistles. Ooh. Two whistles. Really? Why, why would you? Why I've, would you stop at two? <laughs> I've met another whistles. <laughs> oh, we've definitely <laughs> gone on a different timeline because somebody in the chat room is shouting, that "I'm a Juju Netanyahu plant." Joe, flip us back onto the other side. Come on. Oh, um. Uh, oh, 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 okay. <clears throat> Let's get back to woo. The hell with bacon flavored seaweed. I can't. I've got some woo. It's one eleven right now in the UK. All the ones. That's great. Ooh. Ooh. Which make the number three. You add it up. Oh. <laughs> and if you know the <laughs> if you know the secrets of three, six, and nine, you can unlock the secrets of the universe. Who said that, Joe? Uh, Tesla. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. He did say that. For and that is why I had wrote in my head. I can't. And that uh, is why on Monday, myself, Marty, Johnny, and Alex from the Ukraine, with it being episode three, <gasps> six, nine, we're going Tesla, alternative technology, rodent coils, maths, numerology. Tune in for that, folks. Eleven pyramids? p.m. Pyramid? in the UK. You gonna do any pyramids? Oh, they might pop oh. up from time to time. <laughs> Okay. Oh, Stushy has done a cracker in the chat room if you're in there, folks. If you're not in there, head over to truthfrequencyradio.com and click oh, the listen no. live button. I'm stealing that, Stushy. Love oh, it. Yeah, I'm totally taking that one. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. I, uh, I'm so glad that, that he did that, too, because that is just um, September 23rd. Ah, mm. Do you know there's 33 reasons why we should be interested in September, Joe. And that comes from your friend, a good writer, Michael Schneider. Yeah. He's listed 33 reasons why it could be a month to look out for. But I had to say last night, Joe, one of his points is a bit of a stretch because he's saying that the last day of summer is a key kind of thing we need to look out for. But that happens every year, dude. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not quite getting the whole last day. What was, so when's the last day of summer this year? Is it the 21st or 22nd? Hang on, I'll bring up the article. We, we covered this last night, didn't we, guys? But we had a bit of a laugh towards the end because we were rushing through them, trying to get them done. And I came across that one saying the last day of summer. And it just struck me as being a bit of a stretch to add that into your list of 33. Wow. Cool. Yeah, let's, yeah, so let's, let's talk about that because I think that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. And I know, well, it's uh, September 23rd again, Joe. It's that date. It's Marty's favorite number, 23. And I'll post the link for you and I'll post the link for the listeners. Ah, very, oh, very good indeed. Okay. So, so basically what he says is September 1st this year marks the beginning of FEMA's annual national preparedness month. So September 1st is, is is the start of their National Preparedness Month, which, by the way, they do that every year. Okay, so... Since that, 2004, that, I think. Yes. Now, September 7th is Labor Day. Late, what does that mean? 
Is that labor? Like labor? Like labor no pain? Idea. Okay. Uh, the 14th anniversary of September 11th, 7 plus 7, is 14 of 9-11. That seven. takes us into the Shemitah cycle, so that is a relevant one. That's a relevant one. Okay. The last day of trading on Wall Street before the end of the Shemitah year is also September 11th. Okay. Kind of a stretch, you know, but okay. Uh, September 12th. Oh, now this is interesting. Madonna's Rebel Heart Tour opens in the United States. The first stop is Washington, D.C., and according to Holly Deo, the opening theme is desecration of the bride and the arrival of fallen angels. Now, the reason I'm laughing, Joe, is because this is the very one last night that I said that really was the first one that gave me the kind of willies. That's a bit of a weird one, is it not? Because we know one. that Madonna is one of these high priestesses when it comes to the symbology. I'm not saying she's at the top of the pyramid, guys. Hell no. She's a puppet the same as the rest of them. But she does, she really does put it out there. So we need to be watching what she is symbolizing during that, at least, because that comes pre-Pope visit to the US. Well, uh, setting the stage, I guess you could say, perhaps, Kev, you know, maybe a little pre-ritual, if you will. I don't know. Now, September 12th and the 13th, according to Rabbi Chaim um, Kanevsky, a leading authority in the ultra-Orthodox Judaism, has indicated the Messiah is expected to come at any time during those two days. Nope, I'm just not seeing it. But then but, you've got that um, Jewish Institute who have now started this campaign to breed a full herd of unblemished red heifers. Okay. Now, that's all in preparation, of course, for the building of a third temple. And or that was all shown to us in the TV show Dig, which had what? The Blood Moon which is yes. due to t take place on the 28th. And do you not remember, do you not remember during the, during the, the miniseries itself that one time where they cut away for a minute to that message that had nothing to do with the show at all? Well, yes, but, but, but I can kill that woo right now because that turns that out... About wasn't that about Mr. Robot? Yes, it was a clip from Mr. Robot, and I do believe whoever uploaded that file that we hypothetically may have downloaded illegally, they had cut in that, and it was one of the breaks, Joe, and we'd just seen the tail end of a trailer. Okay, good, good. Okay, so anyway, this whole dig thing, dude, yeah, wow. If they're, if they're literally trying to make the unblemished red heifers, uh, I mean, feasibly... Do you need a third temple? Do, does it have to be the one from 70 AD? Well, you surely know? if they fake or kind of force a building of this third temple and to try and, like, push or bring about the coming of their Messiah, surely that would be an antichrist because it wouldn't be the real one anyway, would it? What if CERN is the temple? Ooh. What if, what if CERN's a temple? I mean, it's built on the temple of Apollo on the ancient site of the Temple of Apollo. I'm just saying. The interdimensional Since you said temple. What's that? The interdimensional temple? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know. I mean, it could be. Now, September 13th, right? Last day of the Shemitah year. During the last two Shemitah cycles, we witnessed record-breaking stock market crashes. This is according to Michael Snyder. Uh, on the very last day of the Shemitah, which is Elul 29 on the biblical calendar, so if you go back to September 17, 2001, which was Elul 29, uh, they had the biggest stock market crash in history to that point where the Dow plunged 684 points. And it was a record that was held for exactly seven years until the end of the next Shemitah cycle. And on September 29, 2008, Elul 29, Dow plummeted 777 points, <clears throat> which... Still remains today one of the, uh, the, the the largest drop in history. And now we're in that another Shemitah year where September 13th, 2015, is Elul 29. So it could be significant. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's just when you think of it, the, the last two, Joe, do you know what I mean? 
and especially the last one means 777. Pretty pretty interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's, do you know what I mean? Especially those numbers. I mean, I know it, it's a record number or whatever, and it doesn't look too good for uh, when the stock market does finish it at the end of that, that day. Apart, I mean, going by the last two shimitas, so. Right. Then on the 13th, we also have the last blood moon, which is, <clears throat> I'm sorry, no, that's a partial solar eclipse. They have a partial solar eclipse on the 13th. So on the, the same yeah. day as Elul 29, there's a partial solar eclipse set to happen. It's actually then called the next- Feast of the Trumpets, that one, Joe. And they all talk of trumpets, don't they? I think in the revelations and stuff like that. Just, just putting it out there for you. Yep, 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 yep. And the next day is Rosh Hashanah. September 14th is also the first trading day on Wall Street after the end of the Shemitah. And then we get into some really interesting stuff. September 15th, the 70th session... 70th session of the UN General Assembly begins on this date. It's widely been reported that France plans to introduce a resolution which will give formal UN, formal UN Security Council recognition to a Palestinian statehood. I mean, we know that that's a very controversial topic oh. with the world, not for us. I mean, it, it to me, why not? Go ahead, knock yourself out. They did. But, you know, that could cause a lot of tension out there. He also points out on that day that Jade Helm military exercises are scheduled to end. That's kind of, a, okay, great, they're scheduled to end. <laughs> September Some people 7th, don't even know they've started. Yeah, most, most people don't give a crap that, you know, Posse Comitatus is being violated, even though, you know, they said, well, it's been repealed. It's not even law anymore. It's the principle of it all, okay? Mm-hmm. The last time that happened, you had um, soldiers being quartered in people's houses. You had them just breaking in any time they wanted, rummaging through your stuff, taking whatever they needed, raping people, all that. You want that? Is that what you want? Because that's that's how you go, well, never in America. Nah, nah, it would never happen here. Yeah, right, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Donald Trump will never be elected president, right. So, I mean, yeah, it just it's crazy. No, actually, it would be D's nuts. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, now... September 17th, if there's going to be a rate hike in September, it's probably going to be the 17th. That according to Michael Snyder. Wait, can I cut Typically, in at this point, Joe, because I've been listening to you while I was running away to get coffee there and things like that. And because we're in the alternative media and things move so quickly, we've got a habit of forgetting things. But you know me, I've got a memory like an elephant. And I'm seeing things like the Dow dropping 777 points, 70th anniversary for the UN meeting. We've got this seven-year Shemitah cycle. You know, somebody warned us about this number seven. Take a listen to this. Please join me in giving a warm National Press Club welcome to Managing Director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, As you can tell, I I do as I'm told. And I thought I had to stand up at the time when my immediate predecessor would sit down. And uh, clearly I failed. Um, Good afternoon and thank you very much for having me uh, with you. I would like to thank the National uh, Press Club and especially President Angela Grilling Keane for not only inviting me to this prestigious venue, but essentially presenting the outline of what I want to talk to you about now. So it's as if we had prepared that together, which we have not. Now let me first of all, of course, begin by wishing you all a happy new year. I guess it's still time to do that, given that we are just exactly halfway through between our Western uh, New Year and the Lunar New Year, which will loom in a few weeks' time. I think it's also appropriate to wish ourselves a Happy New Year, given what I would like to talk to you about, which has to do with uh, the global economy and what we should expect for 2014. Now, I'm going to test you um, numerology skills by asking you to think about the magic seven. Okay? Most of you will know that seven is quite a number in all sorts of themes, religions, and uh, I'm sure that you can compress numbers as well. So, 
If we think about 2014, all right, I'll, I'm just giving you 2014, you drop the zero, 14, two times seven. Okay, that's just by way of example, and we're going to carry on. So 2014 will be a milestone and hopefully a magic year in many respects. It will mark the 100th anniversary of the First World War back in 1914. It will mark the 70th anniversary, 70th anniversary, drop the zero, seven, <laughs> of the Bretton Woods Conference that actually gave birth to the IMF. And it will be the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. 25th. So there we go. We get the idea, guys. But this seven is a very key number to the elites and the magicians that are weaving our reality around us, whether it's a call-in sign, whether it's got magical implications, I do not know. But these sevens are key. And when I hear you guys talking about all these sevens in there, Joe, Marty, I'm telling you, that makes me think back to what she was saying. And if you ain't telling me that Christine Lagarde ain't in the know about things like financial collapses and stuff, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Absolutely, Marty. I mean, she's like front and center. If you ask me, you know, she's she's one of the head puppets. Yeah, I mean, look look back to 2008 there. You had the Dow actually dropping by 777 points, which is probably some kind of uh, warning sign to the elites that are actually watching that sort of stuff, the guys in big business and the guys that are really just part of the whole uh, conspiracy in one way or another. And uh, look how many people got rich off that. Look how many small industries were bought up, how Almost. many... His lives were ruined and it's just absolutely scandalous. And then all the bailouts and the cycle starts again. So I'd say if it drops by 777 points again, that's a big red flag. And that 777 definitely is a key number because Crowley, Alistair Crowley himself had a book and it was called Libra 777. So there you go, Joe. Wow. It's just interesting. I always think, I think of a, um, of a slot machine. That's all. There you go. Could you imagine? Yeah. Because isn't isn't the stock market a game of chance? And seven seven sevens like the jackpot. And you know the Chinese they devalued their currency, and if it's all a game of chance and rigged by machines, it was probably rigged by a su supercomputer called the Tian A One A. Maybe that explains why it got hit by a space weapon, Joe. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Keep your eyes on the economy, guys, and those stocks, because I am seeing recent hours that the Dow is actually budging again. Five well, points. We're getting close to that triple seven. There's 23 markets in trouble right now, Marty. 23. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be back on the other side. This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Of tonight's very, very Freaky Friday with me, one of your hosts, Kev Baker. And tonight I'm joined by Big Marty, Johnny Whistles and Joe Joseph. Now we've been getting back in to all the September woo. And I know it's been talked about over and over again. But you know, I love this kind of thing. This is the kind of thing when I was first waking up would have had me on the edge of my seat. And if there's anyone out there that's new to this kind of truth movement new to the path, seeking these answers. All I can say to you is, I've been here before many a time, and I can't tell you for sure that nothing severe and scary isn't going to happen, but I've been here and I've seen it all before, and all I'm trying to say is, don't be scared, guys. That is exactly what they want. And when I see people like the Daily Mail putting out the same story twice about asteroids that aren't going to hit us, then that really puts up my spidey senses and it's almost as if they want us to be looking at September and they want us to be scared but we are bigger and brighter than that here on TFR so we remove the fear we have a little bit of hype just for a laugh and we'll get back into this list and Marty I'm going to come to you this time we got so far down the list I'm not sure what date it was but I'm going to hand it over to you what else is happening in the month of Wootember? Yeah, well, we did cover some of these last night, but we've actually found more on the on this 33 things, so it's good to give some of the new stuff that we've found. 
And basically, we were on the September the 15th there before the break. We were talking about the 70th session of the UN General Assembly. Assembly. And uh, on the same date, you have the Jade Helm military exercise over in the States that is actually scheduled to end, allegedly, depending on what's happening globally, as I said last night. Then September 17th, there's going to be a, 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 rake, uh, a, a rate hike, uh, obviously economy-based, uh, stuff to do with the Federal Reserve. But also, more importantly, September 17th is actually the deadline for Congress's vote on Obama's deal with Iran. So that is very key, I think, to what's going on globally right now. I don't know what you guys think of this Iranian situation. Executive order. <laughs> Executive order. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. Executive order 11658. Let's see. Approve Iran Treaty. Executive order 11659. I like my skivvies pressed this way, please. That's okay. I mean, really, it's it's so yeah. crazy. The the, the the world is just in utter chaos, but it's it seems to always be in utter chaos, don't you think, Kev? Oh, I'm glad you brought that word up because chaos is key to the next point, why we should be looking at September. And this is one of the ones that I think does have some credence because this comes from a globalist and he's basically telling people, 500 days in advance to watch for, I believe it's the 24th of September. Take a listen to this. We have 500 days to avoid the climate chaos. Very important issues, issue of uh, uh, climate change, climate chaos. And we have, I said that we had 500 days to avoid the climate chaos. And I know that President Obama and John Kerry himself are uh, committed uh, uh, on, on this subject and uh, I'm sure that uh, with them, with uh, a lot of other friends, uh, we should be able to reach um, uh, a success in this very... Do you know what gets me about that clip, guys? And that came in May 14th, 2014. Is the fact that when he says that, John Kerry looks at him as if to say, what are you doing? And I wonder if he actually went off script at that one, what, that one point. Maybe that wasn't teleprompted up for him, guys. Was he giving us a clue? Was he giving his friends a clue? Just add it to your list, Marty boy. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he was talking about 500 days there, and I think I worked out the days between calendar to around about that, the 24th date when the um, the Pope's due to address the joint session, the US Congress, and also the day that the asteroid was supposed to pass its closest point. Or oh, hit, as the naysayers are saying, but I'm sure we'll see. Well, what do you think of the fact that the Daily Mail have come out twice now with the same story trying to deny this asteroid, Joe? Because I hate when I see the mainstream media going with conspiracy kind of stories because that then tells me they're trying to get us into a mindset or trying to prepare us for something. I don't know, man. All I know is that <clears throat> if, if that's going to happen, uh, not much uh, fearing it's going to do. They would know. Point. They would know. They would know, and, and a lot of other people would know. A lot of uh, amateur astronomers would know. They would know the exact time and place where it would be. Absolutely. Hit. I mean, it, it, it's not – see, it's not proprietary information for NASA. Th there are people with telescopes out there that and, – and by the way, some of these armchair astronomers have some really high-powered telescopes, you know? So I'm just saying, man, if that's going to happen, we would – and well by now know that something like this is going to happen. You know, th there's there's other organizations too, uh, whistles like uh, MUFON and other organizations that get into this stuff. So the information would get out. And I just, it, it's not, um, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know why would they would have to lie about something like that. Well, Joe, is there not, like a, a, a certain window that something would have to come through. The keyhole, Johnny, the keyhole. Yeah, key that <laughs> keyhole thing, it, do you know what I mean? So although they get these um, stories of asteroids and things that are earthbound, uh -huh. it, it could be earthbound until they actually look at this thing to see if it's coming through the keyhole and then they usually find that, okay, it's going to miss it by so many thousand miles yeah. Oh, that would that 
I mean, that there, it tells you itself that it's definitely not coming through that keyhole, that's for sure. Oh, right. Or, or perhaps, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they just mess up. Oh, yeah, don't worry. It's going to mess us. Oops. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, who didn't realize that the gravitational pull of the moon is actually going to make that comet act like a curveball and just kind of come right in, you know? And <laughs> yeah, You've also got CERN as well. Uh, firing at full power, so if there is an asteroid, what is that? Is that going to do to the trajectory of the thing? Is that going to change it? Well, you imagine know? it's got a lot of iron in it, possibly, John. Imagine it pulled it in. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With CERN. Yeah, so maybe it isn't due to actually hit going off the diagrams, but when CERN's cranked right up with those iron particles, then... Oh. Well, tell me, guys, these are probably brainier than me, but is platinum magnetic? Uh, I only ask because that recent comet that flew overhead... Yeah. Pl- looking, is it platinum? Yes, it was a platinum core that was worth three three billion dollars. Wow. So yeah. if platinum's magnetic, that fits for our uh, pulling it in scenario. Yeah, well, uh, I think in its pure form, platinum's not magnetic in itself. Damn, right, damn, damn. Platinum alloys can be magnetic once you mix it with something, I suppose. You don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be mixed with other metals. Yeah. Bummer. <laughs> Sorry, man. But you know, Maybe those organic compounds are turning it magnetic. Well, the, the other thing that a lot of people don't realize with these atom smashers are the fact that um, just it's not just the smashing of the atoms that cause this energy release or these fields. It's the circular motion of it. It's yes. it going. It, that's where the real power lies. You know, you don't necessarily have to smash the atoms. You just accelerate them to the speed of damn near the speed of light. And you create like a magnetic vortex, you know? You know that this is still what gets me though, Joe, because there's something wrong with physics somewhere because they tell us that they're accelerating these protons up to 99.99999% the speed of light. Yeah. Now, Einstein told us that when you get to the speed of light, you can't actually get there. But as you approach it, your mass will become infinite. Well, how do the protons stay in that tube in that tiny, tiny quantum atomic size. Surely their mass should increase. Well, they would. Well, that's what I'm saying, but they don't. So something's wrong somewhere, surely. How do you know they're not? Well, because have you seen the diameter of the pipe? It's very, very small. Yeah, but I mean, you're still talking, you're still talking small part. I mean, even if it does increase in mass by how much you're talking about an ion, but you know that's what I mean. The thing, once you get, it's to not that, like it's going to become like a five-pound ion all of a sudden. Well, why I'm isn't it? Saying. Why isn't it? Because Einstein said if you took a spaceship and th- and started approaching the speed of light, we would increase in our mass. To By how point, much? Well, wait till I Google it. <laughs> oh yes, while, while you're talking about that, um, uh, this is a part of the CERN experiment that's always troubled me, and even. My- Tony Patch couldn't really explain it because when I asked him about it, he said, "No, you're on the money," but he didn't explain why. My uh, brother Greg asked, "Do you do you guys think it's possible that China may drop an EMP during the month of September in retaliation for the Rod of God attack?" First of all, you know, Rod of God's great, but that's so like twentieth uh, century, like nineteenth century technology. Even if it's a satellite, I-, I just fail to see it. We have scalar technology. You know, since we're talking about EM, um, that makes that absolutely, it'd be ridiculous. Well, I'm going, for a, I'm going for an exotic weapon, right? And here's one thing I want people to look at. I want yeah. people to look at the toasted cars. Oh, right. Because that Toast- looks very much like the toasted cars that were visible around 9-11. Yeah, so it'd be like a scalar, that's a scalar hit. Possibly something. Well, I don't know something. I'm I'm going rods of God. See, and I, I and I would go and I would go scalar because why would you want to leave a tungsten a tungsten signature? And you're going to have it somewhere. It's not going to just uh, disintegrate. It's not going to do that. You're going to have a signature left from what you just put in the ground. And, and so why do that? A scalar hit leaves no uh, evidence. It just looks like it, an explosion. 
and you and, use the chemicals that are already on site. Yeah, yeah. Or, or China just has such deplorable safety and um, labor conditions that this sh- kind of stuff happens all the time there. That's the other thing too. It just seems too coincidental that it comes at the same kind of time as the devaluation of the yuan. That's just I my t- take. But see, Marty's totally what's in there. Go ahead, Marty. Oh, that was actually from before, guys. But yeah, very fascinating. You should bring up the China incident. There is definitely a lot of speculation and theories and stuff going on with that whole situation. And what I'll say is, what an explosion. Absolutely blew me away. Yeah. You know, that scene, I mean, you've seen the first part and I thought that's kind of bad. And then next minute it was just, I don't know. <laughs> if anybody's not seen that by now, and I'm sure you have, uh, go and check it out. Well, Marty, have you also seen the explosion that occurred in Egypt at the courthouse? That thing was a massive fireball as well. And I'm quite surprised that there's not more talk on the internet of that being some kind of exotic weapon, something like that. Johnny, you're wanting in here. I was thinking what Gregor was asking there about an EMP attack. What would that do for all the nuclear reactors that are going to be more... I mean, I know they've got backup. Yeah, but, but they do and they don't. You know surely what I mean? they're yeah. in a Faraday cage, surely. No, but, but, but the it, thing is, they're not because it, it it would only cost something like five billion to um, to make sure that they were okay. Kev, but the fact that nothing's been done about it, two billion, is it two, two billion, Joe? Two billion to harden our entire electrical grid to EMP. Two billion dollars. Wow. Yeah. yeah, we could do it tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, really, it's that easy. Get more to Israel. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. No, no. You know what, Johnny? You make a very valid point. However, it would not be in China's interest to do so under the current economic structure that we have in place. Okay, so if they're going to do that, they know that they're it's uh, it, it's the end of the world as we know it. Because in its current form, we're China's biggest customer. Even if they hate us, we're China's biggest customer. So I'm just saying. That I don't think uh, that that it would go down that road. I just I just don't, and I don't think they're that foolish. Unless some hell broke loose. I mean, there's so many proxy wars. Yeah, sure. All these nations right now, it's really hard to tell. And like we've said before, it only takes one idiot to really trigger things off. Exactly. Yeah. And do China really need to launch an EMP attack? Haven't no. they been making the chips for years? Surely they've got back doors into all the systems they need. <laughs> And then you've got the, we've heard of the Stuxnet that the Mossad and the CIA and the MI6 and everyone like to use. Surely these Chinese hackers have got their very own infrastructure killing viruses that they could launch at the stroke of a button. Why would the Chinese want to ruin their own country? They own most of America anyway, don't they? Well, you could bring it down so you could roll on in. True. Maybe they are. They're just going to move the Americans all out to China and these new cities that's all been built. I mean, ah, they've even got the New York cities. there. Yes, Paris, London, Rome. Sounds like a song. That's right, the Chinese ghost cities. That is something to keep your eyes on, folks, because I don't know what they're for. We had the ambassador on at one point saying that they are built in preparation for mass migration of people for whatever reason i do not know but i don't know oh, hang on has greg got any more here yeah. what do you think is that another question from greg guys no no kev no it's just in it's a uh, too many things going on for it not to happen it must be more than a scare tactic uh, it's a fascinating month already. It's, it appears to be September. So many different things to keep your eye on. And uh, I think we're going to have a hell of a job, guys, trying to get through all this information in September. Well, I'm glad we've got a nightly show because just one show a week or something just wouldn't be able to cover everything that's going on in that month. i tell you what, the one thing or two things I'm really looking for in the whole month, and that'll be the financial markets because I do think, I do give some credence to this whole Shemitah cycle, and also this kind of declaration of Palestine being a state at the UN, 
I can't see that going unmarked. Now, that might be an uptick in kind of hostilities over in the Middle East. You might think that might not affect us folks, maybe not initially, but that has got the potential to snowball. And we have to look at places like North Korea, Ukraine, this whole ISIS crisis that's going on. We don't have our problems to seek, Johnny, whatever month it is. No, you're right, Kev. And I think um, you should keep an eye on France because France and Ireland, I think, are the ones pushing for um, the Palestinian recognition. And I could see something maybe again cropping up in France, something like the Charlie Hebdo thing, Kev. Well, you know, John, definitely you mentioned Charlie Hebdo. And before we came to air tonight, there was an incident in France on a train. Now, there was a gunman opened fire and it was three off-duty U.S. Marines, I believe, that actually managed to wrestle a gunman with a Kalashnikov and a knife, I believe, to the ground, and he was arrested at one of the next stops on the line. And it was Paris to Amsterdam, the train. And um, I don't know if that was some kind of incident taking place. I've not had a chance to look at it. But like you say, Johnny, Charlie Hebdo, that was timed right after the French were shouting about Palestine. And I reckon they should be watching their backs again. But the man to go to for that would definitely be Big Marty. Marty, do you think the nutty Netanyahu crew will sit back and accept all this, especially with France putting it out there? I really don't think so. Um, I think that also the people have actually had enough. I know Netanyahu has uh, been victim to, thank God, <laughs> to a petition to have him actually arrested when he arrives here in London in September. I think that's over 70,000, 80,000 signatures now. We know it won't happen. Uh, he won't be arrested for his war crimes in Gaza back there. But, I mean, talking of all that kind of stuff, there is actually rising tensions again over there right now. And going off patterns in the past and all these blood moons, there's always some sort of uh, conflicts going on around that time. So I think definitely we're in for something else. Well, Marty, we had Israel striking Syria overnight. Now, that was in retaliation to some kind of shelling or some fire that had come the other way from the Assad's army. However, when I see Israel and Syria starting to square up, I really do get worried because then you start factoring in Iran into the equation and we've got Assad being supplied by Putin still. And we've been seeing in recent weeks the fact that it's been put out there, mainly in the Western media, that Putin's going to back away from Assad and leave him to it. However, now we're seeing more MiG fighters being delivered. And again, it all ties into this kind of proxy war scenario that we were laying out last night or the night before. Yeah, it really does. Uh, I think the Syrian situation is definitely also something to watch. Um, I, I just wonder how far, how long it will be till he actually, you know, drag Bashar al-Assad out onto the street like they did to Gaddafi and put it all over the media and, and literally just liberate the whole country. Because we know that's the plan, right? And then from there, it'll be Iran, like you say. I really hope that Putin is as strong as his word, because I remember back when it happened to Gaddafi, he turned around, or at least it was alleged he had said that he wouldn't let that happen again. And I'm hoping he stands strong by the side of Assad, because it was him and the alternative media and the fact that people don't buy the crap anymore that we avoided war back in 2013, Johnny, when we had that chemical false flag attack that was blamed on Assad but blatantly came from these rebel held positions and these rebels now we call them ISIS yeah I know it's incredible Kev and you knew you knew that it was going to happen Kev because as soon as Obama says that chemical weapons will be the red line and honestly I think it was only something like two or three days after that do you know what I mean this thing happened and it was just too dodgy at the time. Do you know what I mean? It was too dodgy at the time when people looked at it and then when people were actually going in and finding out that it wasn't uh, Assad that was firing these things. Do you know what I mean? So you were talking about, or Marty was talking about Assad getting dragged about in the street and things. But Kev, would Iran stand back? and let that happen. If Putin 
was to step aside, would Iran, would they let that happen to Assad? I don't think they would, but again, at the same time, I look at a lot of these countries as coming under the umbrella of these superpowers, and I wonder how much any of these countries would do without the blessing of Putin in the first place. The same as I wonder how much Kim Jong-un really does without the blessing of Beijing. But people are probably wondering out there, well, how is this all tie into Freaky Friday? And Marty, that's because all of this, it's all still ongoing. It's been going on for years and years now, and it all seems to be coming to some kind of head. And with everyone talking September, with blood moons, everything else, and with some of the killings that you see this ISIS crew getting up to, and I'm not talking about the site media ones, I'm talking about the real ones on the ground. Yeah, the ritualistic killings. There's not, no other way of describing what they're getting up to. That really yeah. ties in to the kind of interdimensional entities that we talk about on here, Marty Boy. Absolutely, it definitely all connects. I mean, you had Voice of America there six hours ago saying that the US sees the end closing in on Assad. And like you say, we've been talking about this maybe for 18 months or so, maybe more. And um, we always said that that would be some dire consequences if that ever happened, especially with Iran having the back and uh, Putin and so many other nations involved in these kind of proxy wars. Uh, it's a very complex situation. And definitely with everything happening in September and ev happening right now, it could absolutely tie in. Let's hope not, but you never know. Keep an open mind and don't be in fear. You know, I wonder with 7.3 billion of us on this planet right now, with this hive mind, this collective consciousness that's obviously growing with the numbers that are here, maybe that in itself starting to speed things up. Now, on the other side of the break, we'll be getting into some CERN woo, guys. And that all ties into this as well, because that's literally going to be opening the doorways, possibly, to the entities that we're talking about, the entities that people like ISIS and the globalists are doing the bidding for. And Greg, Joe's brother, was asking, or he was saying, there's so many things going on, and it's hard to get your head around them. And that's why it's good, guys, to come here on a Friday and have three hours to kind of slowly just talk about it. We certainly don't know what's going on, but I think it helps not only the listeners out there, but it even helps us guys get a, ple a clearer picture of what may or may not be ahead. Joe, you're and back it, with us. And if it, and if, if for nothing else, it's therapeutic. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. Let's you know, the X-Files to shame, man. It, it sure does. And But, but Kev, is CERN the only one? Oh, now that is a question, and that is something that will be covered on the other side. But these particle accelerators, before we get to this video that we're going to be playing from, our good friends, and it's um, the people over at Truth Stream Media, Aaron and Melissa Dykes. Let's just think about all the pre-programming and the TV shows for these particle accelerators. And one that's really, really struck you, Joe, is this one that had the pilot episode where it showed you a nuke going off, I believe, was it not? Yeah, Rewind. Yeah. And a sci-fi series in 20, 2013 that never went on the air. Yeah, and it's just very interesting, you know? And yeah, they do make references to September 23rd, although that reference to September 23rd is a bit weak. But still, it's there. I, I like more of yeah. the, the, the symbolism with the... Um, the CERN and opening dimensional doorways itself. If anything, that was what I took from that. You know? Well, the Joe, just... This thing is a deception to me. Go ahead. Yeah, just to interject there with the September 23rd thing, something I mentioned last night on the show, a new movie coming out of Israel called Jerusalem, actually spelled Jerusalem with a Z. Uh, go and check the trailer for that out, guys. And it actually depicts the end of the world on oh, September yeah, the 23rd. Her, and it talks about the uh, beasts coming out of the fiery pit and the gates being opened in the trailer. So it all ties into yes. certain stuff. But I, you're right. So they do they do mix in that. There's an awful lot of it. And uh, boy, we'll get into those gateways on the other side of the break. Is CERN the only one? Let's explore that here on Freaky Friday on Truth Frequency Radio. TruthFrequencyRadio.com. Real like people. It? Real radio. Wherever you are, make it TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. It's our number three right here on Freaky Friday. And things are about to go right through the Stargate because we're going to get into some CERN information. And more importantly, 
particle accelerators on the whole. And like Joe was saying, just how many of these particle accelerators are there in reality? Sit back and listen in. Hey guys, so Good evening. this video is going to be a bit speculative, but because of the subject matter, you have to be. And you know, even though I hate that in some ways, I feel like a discussion does need to be had over something that we heard recently, and I haven't seen anyone talk about it, and it really, it kind of sucks anyway when you start talking about CERN, which is part of what I'm going to talk about tonight. If you don't have glowing, flowing things to say about it, then you are labeled a crazy Luddite who's against science and ignorant and you shouldn't be allowed to voice any concerns at all. You shouldn't be allowed to have an opinion. And I just don't think that's exactly fair. I mean, obviously we're not a democracy because they just did this. They're doing it. They don't really care what you think. They'll let you know about it. Well, they'll tell you some stuff, but there's no... Let's all take a vote. No, we live in a scientific dictatorship where the scientists are going to tell you what they're going to do and you're either going to pay attention or not. That's what's going on. There was no vote on, does the world think we should be smashing particles and trying to let these people find the glue that holds the universe together? No, there was no major vote on that. I mean, think about it, guys. These are the same people, by the way, that think the world is overpopulated and a large portion of you should be dead. So do we really want them to find the glue that holds the universe together and then mess with it? I don't know that I do. Of course, I was never asked my opinion. Neither were you. Well, and they expect you only to talk about the surface issues the way they're presented and not what's metaphorically and literally buried underneath. Which is very interesting, considering everything that surrounds CERN is occultic symbolism stuff and metaphysical stuff. They kind of put a lot of things right out in your face. Look at the logo. You can't look at this logo and tell me you don't see the triple six here. It's in your face. I mean, you have two little lines here, and then you have a six, a six, and a six. I mean, you got that, and if that's not good enough for you, if you say, oh, no, no, that's just that's just a particle collider thingy or whatever it's supposed to be, fine, that's great. Then go ahead and explain to me why it is that they're also making their acronym spell Satan on purpose. Okay, this one is for the system to analyze tremendous amounts of nuclear data. And they had to work real hard on this one because they lowercase the D so that it would spell Satan. It's not exactly the kind of thing you do to make other people feel real warm and squishy about what you're doing. Just say, okay? And this is all over their website where they talk about how they had an experiment at CERN for a solar axion search using a decommissioned magnet. Experiment Satan, okay? Again, doesn't exactly elicit lots of confidence. Also not eliciting confidence would be this story on... Joseph P. Farrell's site about how one of the original CERN physicists said, we have no effing idea what we're doing. And I'm not saying that that's a quote. We, the physicists, have no effing idea what we're doing. This is Dr. Goswami, and he says here that seriously, when myself, Higgs, and Ben, who was CERN's first president, first pitched the idea, we never thought it would get funding. It was going to cost billions, for Christ's sake. He recalled, F knows what the thing does. No one does. Firing particles at each other at the speed of light can't end well. I'm just worried now we took the joke too far. So it's, it's not like I'm saying it's disconcerting that they're talking about opening up doorways to other dimensions. These it's, are the kind of it's this is stuff they're saying. It's creepy, and a lot of people are apprehensive about it. I mean, you got Stephen Hawking coming out saying that they're going to destroy the planet with this, okay? That's Stephen Hawking saying it. He's got the scientific background. I don't. He's saying that. Other scientists are saying that. And one of the guys who was there when they first thought of the Large Hadron Collider is saying, we have no effing idea what we're doing. Doesn't elicit confidence. Now, moving on to this, this is, this is the reason I'm making this video right now. We put up this video the other day, how CERN will affect your soul. And... I knew people were going to get cranky, and some people did in the comments, but, you know, the guy had a lot of information to share. And he said, supposedly he was a guy who had worked closely on CERN, 
he sounded like he knew exactly what he was talking about for a lot of this. And I thought it was worth a video worth sharing. But one of the points that he made in here went by very, very quickly and no one talked about it. I mean, this video has 660 comments and now one person in here mentioned this point that this man made. And the point is this. I, I probably won't be in trouble for this, but they have a weapon concerning dark matter that they can put within a country or a specific place to cause chaos. It's a weapon. They've used it before. Countries are vested in the CERN facility. Every single last country. In the United States, we have three facilities here. Three. I, I can't tell you where they are. Three. I, I can't tell you where they are. One is, one, they began to build, but they couldn't, but they went ahead and built it anyway. It's in one of the biggest states in the United States, and it's there and it's operational. It's also going to be powered up during this time. Did you hear what he said? He's saying that we have large particle accelerators of the level of CERN, Large Hadron Collider, in this country underground and nobody knows about it. And one of the ones he's saying is in my backyard. It's in Waxahachie. He's talking about the super conducting super collider project. And this is where we get real speculative, but the question has been put before you guys. It's been put before all of us. Over a hundred thousand people watched that video and no one brought this up, but I think maybe we should. Is it possible they built the superconducting super collider, it's there, and undeclared black ops project? That's the question. Well, and if you're just quick to hop on the idea that that's not possible and it's ridiculous, you should keep in mind how many black projects have been sequestered away somewhere in a dark closet or a giant Indiana Jones warehouse that the public has no clue about. Planes, bombs, missiles, advanced technologies, weapons that most people couldn't name or describe but are available and in many cases have been used. I mean, this is what we're talking about. Things that have shown up on Senate budget hearings and it'll be a line item and it'll be there for a couple years and all of a sudden, oh, where'd it go? It's gone. I don't know where it went. It went somewhere. They don't spend millions of dollars and billions of dollars on stuff and then go, ah, we changed our mind. Nah, I don't think so. That money goes somewhere and something comes out of it. Now, there's obviously nothing you can prove here, but it is interesting to go look back at some of this information about the super collider that supposedly never was. If you go back and look at this, you will see that they didn't just quit right away. It actually started in 82, 83. They finally decided upon it in 87. And they went full steam ahead with building it. And by the end of it, when Congress finally pulled the plug in 93 on the funding, and then the last people moved out of the buildings there in 96, by that time, they had spent two billion dollars and they had dug 14 miles of tunnel. The superconducting super collider was going to be 54 miles in diameter. It was going to be huge. It was going to encircle the entire city of Waxahachie. Okay? It was going to be the biggest particle accelerator known to man. It was going to go 20 TeV per beam. Which, you know, CERN's Large Hadron Collider goes 16 that's just what they tell you. Obviously, they've capped it at that. They're not going to tell you what else they're doing, okay? But this was going to be bigger, and it was going to go higher, okay? And $2 billion was spent. And I know today that sounds like some funny Monopoly money. Who cares? But back in the early, the late 80s, early 90s, you got to think about how much $2 billion was then. It was more, okay? And 14 miles a tunnel, and then suddenly they changed their mind, right? But also, if you look at this project, going all the way back to George H.W. Bush being vice president, it started under Reagan, okay, obviously. But a lot of people have said that the Reagan presidency was really just a George H.W. Bush presidency. And that's a comment I've seen many times. 
if you Definitely. go back, you go, Definitely. yeah, you go back and read some of these articles about it, and you'll see that this project was always George H. W. Bush's baby. Okay, all the way back from when he was vice president, and he put it on the fast track. Okay, this was always his baby. The president stopped in a town called Waxahachie, Texas, which is home to the Superconductor Super Collider Project. The eight and a quarter billion dollar atom smasher is designed to help physicists better understand matter. The Super Collider suffered a blow last month when the House of Representatives voted to cut off its federal funding. After a tour of the site, the president spoke in support of the project. Now, the Super Collider. The Super Collider is one of the greatest scientific projects in the entire world. And today, new frontiers beckon. New discoveries await. New progress lies before us. And our adventure is not to sail the open ocean, but rather to go to the edge of the universe and see the birth of space and of time. Our vessel is not called Santa Maria. It is a super collider. But human imagination is still our compass, and human ingenuity and yearning for progress our only power. And to those who would sacrifice tomorrow for today, I say trust in America's future. Trust in America's incredible capacity for renewal and innovation. And trust in the spirit that is here today. For ours is an eternal voyage to greatness, and each and every one of you is a part of that voyage. And trust in the spirit that is here today. For ours is an eternal voyage. This was always his baby. And actually, to, to make an even bigger point of that, they had 25 different locations they talked about putting this thing. And they finally settled actually on North Carolina because of the most important criterion, geology. So they were going to build it in North Carolina. However, if you go back and look, two days after George H.W. Bush gets elected, two days, what does he do? The very first thing that happens is they decide to build the super collider in Texas. No, I, I never heard about this project. I guess it had really fallen off into the annals of history, but... Maybe that's what they wanted. Two days after he's elected, they move the whole project to Texas. And when I say move the whole project, go back and read some of these articles. They moved in physicists from all over the world to Waxahachie, Texas, to start working at local universities and set up their own little sections there. And I mean, this was a huge project. You go back and look at the resources in it, like some of the speeches. This here is a speech that George H.W. Bush gave when he uh, signed the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Act of 1993. And he talks about how this was going to be one of the most important projects ever. 7,000 first-tier jobs across the country. They had already awarded 23,000 contracts. Whenever they didn't think this project was going to get passed during the Reagan era, okay, they were calling up. George H.W. Bush, and when he became president, he was having meetings where he would have senators who were opposed to the project come have breakfast with him. His first year as president was the first year that we really needed to, to make a big jump in the funding. We were asking for an additional $200 million from the previous year. We called President Bush and asked him to make a telephone call to the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Tom Bell of Alabama. President Bush did more than make a phone call. He invited Congressman Bevel and Congressman Myers, the ranking Republican, to come to the White House and have breakfast. We got the money. And he, he went very far. This was very, very important to him. In fact, his whole meeting in Japan, remember the one where he unfortunately vomited on the prime minister in Japan? That whole meeting was set up for him to go over and talk about getting funding from Japan to be a partner on this project, on the superconducting super collider. That was the whole reason he went over there. Last year, when it became apparent that we needed to really accelerate our request for international funding, we asked the president to elevate the request for the Japanese. He's had two meetings with Prime Minister Miyazawa to, to make that a 
personal priority of the prime ministers. And today, after the president leaves, the Japanese working group will be here at the SSC to continue those negotiations. When we lost the vote in the House this year, first of all, President Bush did everything we asked him to do in the House of Representatives, everything that he was asked to do, plus a lot more that he wasn't asked to do. But once we lost the vote in the House, we knew that we had to really go all, all out in the Senate. Two weeks ago, President Bush had some of the undecided senators down to the White House and convinced at least two of the senators that voted against the project last year to vote for the project this year. And I will fight hard and continue to fight hard for the super collider and call everybody necessary. And then you go back and look at some of this stuff about this collider. It's just, you know, little bits and pieces here and there, but project director was Roy Schwitters. Roy Schwitters was the chair of the Jason Defense Advisory Group from 2005 to 2011. Okay. Which is part of MITRE, the super defense contractor that is arguably part of the shadowy shadow government. And this is somebody who was a professor of physics at Harvard and Stanford. He has degrees from MIT. And Jason, if you need to know more about that, if you don't know who that is, you should look it up. But yeah, we're talking about high-level scientists. Like Rand Corporation stuff. Who are directly advising the Pentagon on top secret projects. And he was the guy running the whole thing. I also found this, which I thought was interesting. The guy you saw in the C-SPAN video who was giving the tour, Don Capone. The magnet building was to have built a hundred or so of the specialty magnets that were required for some of the unique locations within the super collider machine itself. There were two other facilities. Interestingly, he was the head of superconducting super technology there. Uh, from 1989 to 1995, so six years he was there. And in the last year, he was seconded to TNRLC to work alternative uses for the project following cancellation. And he worked at Argonne before that. Well, in 2012, MagnaBlend, a fracking fluids company that makes other kinds of chemicals, they bought the buildings that are sitting on the surface. And what do you have? Oh, all of a sudden you have... This guy working as the director of quality and business optimization at the SSC facility. I just think that's very interesting and strange. I mean, they left these buildings sitting out there abandoned for years. Of course, they were always in really great condition. It wasn't like they let them rot. There's stories about how they're just rotting away in the desert, but they never rotted. I mean, the, the buildings were fine. So that's not exactly how it went down. But they definitely left them there as a symbol of this place being completely abandoned. Although... Aaron, didn't you say you found an art or a mention of it? Yeah, there was the scuttlebutt from a decade ago. People who did some urban exploring there. And, uh, you know, there were rumors that they were talking about from the area because, you know, Waxahachie's right outside of Dallas. People saying, well, actually, the tunnels were completed. At least that's the rumor. Some people claim to have been in them and in the buildings. And this is all before Magnablin took over. But what a perfect cover if really there was something that was completed and stuff was still going on or they hope to revive it in the near future i mean these tunnels were built down pretty deep they were underneath i saw some guy in the chat there talking about how he talked to one of these scientists and they were built down under the water table or whatever like way down in there i mean this is just the beginning of one that goes down behind here i mean these tunnels were deep okay so if there was something sitting out there, if there was a giant superconducting super collider 54 miles in diameter sitting out there right now, it would be way under the ground. And how would you ever really know? How could you really ever prove it? It's all totally speculative. But the way the guy says it in the video, he just says it. I mean, he just says it straight up like it's a fact. Which got me thinking, what if it's possible? I mean, this was really important. Oh, I forgot to even mention this. I just came across as well. This is a directorate of intelligence from the CIA on the prospects for Soviet cooperation on the super collider project, Moscow, about Moscow, about bringing people over right after the Cold War for Moscow to work on this project. And it says release as sanitized because a lot of the stuff in this report is redacted. So there's whole sections of this that are missing. But... Basically, it talks about the Super Collider project and all the stuff that it was going to be able to do. 
And then they go down, and of course, I mean, like I said, there's all these sections that have been completely redacted out of this thing, so they're not even going to let you know. But they went through and did dossiers on a whole bunch. Like, see this page? That's completely redacted. Who knows what that page was? They did dossiers on key Soviet players in SSC decision-making. And they talk about their influence and access, their cooperation, their professional status, their expertise, and whether or not they speak English, how old they are. They put a lot of effort into this. So the CIA was involved and very interested in this project, which is another reason why I'm sick and tired of hearing people say that things like particle accelerators cannot be weaponized. Don't use a particle accelerator as a death ray. Now, when I was putting together this lecture, I asked the question to my colleagues, my very esteemed colleagues, has anyone ever tried to develop an accelerator as a weapon? And they said, oh, mumble, mumble, Cold War, space, Star Wars, something and rather. No, that was their conclusion. Um, they were wrong. Uh, people in the US did think about building a, a particle accelerator, called a neutral beam accelerator, that they would launch into space. That's the first bit which is a bit wacky, and then they would use it to shoot down um, satellites and shoot down missiles and destroy anything that they didn't like because they were going to have this super powerful beam in space. Well, they quickly realized that this was crazy. Give me a break. Well, but that's kind of the point too with this stuff. If something happened once this project was decommissioned or off the books, if that's going on, there's not a lot we're going to know about it. We do know that deep underground military bases exist. They're very secretive. They're black budgeted. And they could go as deep as 8,000 feet. They could be many, many stories deep. There could be any number of things going on down there. How, How would you know? Yeah. That's the point. I mean, people are getting all freaked out about CERN and they're getting all upset about September. And I hear you and I understand why. I mean, they've got their creepy occultic opera they're having in the collider. The dance of destruction. I mean, all this stuff. I see it and I hear what you're saying. But for a second, just think about the possibility that CERN is not the largest collider on the planet. And that the government has bigger ones underground, off the record. I mean, they won't even admit Area 51 exists, guys. Okay? And we know it exists. It's right there on the surface. You're never going to hear about this. It would be one of those things that's born black, as they say. It's a black op project from the beginning. It would always be off the record. But if you think CERN is unaccountable, I mean, at least CERN puts up their charts of beams and things, and who knows how accurate those are if they're actually telling you the truth. But at least they put some stuff up and let you know something, okay? This would be completely off the record, run by the shadow government, run by the CIA, George H.W. Bush's friends, whatever, the military industrial complex, you name it, and you would never know. And oh, by the way, the scientists at CERN, who want to build an even bigger collider now, are talking about reviving the SSC as a Higgs factory, not the original circle, which on this map is already there as if it's completed, but an even bigger one, which would encircle all of Dallas, between Dallas and Fort Worth. This, this here. And if you think 16 or 20 TEV sounds crazy, start looking at some of the numbers they're talking about down here. They're talking about 50 TEV, which is what CERN is talking about. And then they start getting into what happens if they want to go above 100 TEV. At that point, they'll just switch out the magnets and this loop would come, become a 300 TEV collider. I just think it's interesting that when you look at this map and they talk about building a new Higgs factory, they show the circle, but then they have this much, much bigger one here that they're actually talking about. So was the circle completed or not? Wow, it's hard to believe those types of people would let the big fish go, especially with two billion plus spent on a project supposedly just abandoned. I don't buy it. Our vessel is not called Santa Maria. It is a super collider. I, I can't tell you where they are. One is one they began to build, but they couldn't, but they went ahead and built it anyway. President Bush did everything we asked him to do in the House of Representatives to go to the edge of the universe and see the birth of space and of time. But 
they couldn't, but they went ahead and built it anyway. It's in one of the biggest states in the United States, and it's there and it's operational. The Super Collider is one of the greatest scientific projects in the entire world. And it's there and it's operational. Everything that he was asked to do, plus a lot more that he wasn't asked to do. And I will fight hard and continue to fight hard for the Super Collider and call everybody necessary. And it's there and it's operational. It's also going to be powered up during this time. So there you go, folks. Wow. Talk about mind-blowing. And we'll get you on the other side of the break for the last segment of what has been a really, really great Freaky Friday. This is Truth Frequency Radio. The wicked ones, obviously, under heavy, heavy Masonic influence. <laughs> Live for the last section of your favorite show, Freaky Friday, right here on your number one network www.truthfrequencyradio.com Now that clip we played in the last section of the show you can find over at truthstreammedia.com Truthstream Media over on YouTube and on Facebook and that's from Aaron and Melissa Dykes and I think you'll all agree that that is so beyond anything that you see on YouTube normally. Guys, I mean if you could give them a standing ovation for that it's certainly deserving but I'll come to you first, Joe, because one of the pieces of that actual clip there was referring back to the clip that you played last week, and that's concerning antimatter. So what's your take on all this antimatter angle, Joe? Because this is a new kind of aspect on the whole CERN thing for me, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I think they're trying to control it, <clears throat> like the guy said, you know, that they, they know now how to contain it but it's it's all about when it interacts with with us you know with 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 regular matter it instantly destroys itself and does so in a very very um chaotic fashion so uh the other the other thing is as he said I, what did he say that they had like the the weapons where you could just put it out there it obviously would have to be deployed and it would have to be contained, but if you're just around it, it has negative effects on the human psyche, on human behavior. I I, I don't know. It seems it seems plausible to me. I it, it really does. And that's that's a scary part of this technology, is that's just one of the uses of the technology, isn't it, Whistles? I mean, these devices, again, the the scientists, the powers that shouldn't be, have built some amazing machines that do so many different things. Isn't that right? Yeah, Essen, when you're talking about antimatter, why has nobody ever looked for uncle matter? I mean, if there's an antimatter, there must be an uncle matter. So why has nobody ever mentioned it? Uh, I think that un the uncle matter is actually dark matter. <laughs> No way. Oh. Excellent. Oh, Wait. my God. Did you With call an end to that, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I can't take it. That's why I love whistles. Yeah. Hey, hey, whistles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was awful. Uncle Matter. <sighs> Does it matter? Well, I think some of this kind of ties into the black goo stuff that we were talking about last week and the programmable matter that could be something that they're kind of working towards, definitely. You also see that in the Terminator movie. Um, I know it's a Hollywood reference, but still makes a, a definite connection there in when, uh, spoiler alert, but John Connor is actually attacked by the, the Skynet guy. And yes, black dude! Oh! That yeah. Oh, like goo goes all over his face, and then basically he's changed and morphed into one of these programmable um, things. I, I I can't even I can't agree with you more, Marty. There was so much symbolism in that movie. Oh, it was unbelievable. And I I got to be honest with you, Kev, I didn't expect that at all. I was 
I had no idea. I was just like looking through some movies. I'm like, oh, really? Absolutely. And I think we should just get off calling them movies. They're probably like infomercials because there's, infomercials. More, <laughs> there's more truth in that than there is when you actually watch the documentaries with half these talking heads with their white coats on saying that they've done this study and that. And they found out how many fruit pastels it takes to choke a kestrel. Who cares? That's right. It's like this. It's a... Uh... It's uh, Billy Mays as John Connor in... <laughs> come to Kev Nye, science guy. I mean, come on, dude. It's like he doesn't do... He not only does his laundry with OxyClean, but he also kicks ass for Skynet. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You're right. It is becoming an infomercial for the powers it shouldn't be. But then again, th- that's their media. That's how they put it out there. You you forget they're the ones that are funding it. So what was the name of that program again that you were referring to earlier on, Joe, with the nine twenty three symbolism? Rewind. Well, if you think about that, in that they have a new kind of brand of cops, kind of investigators, and what they do is they go into a room where they have the largest particle collider in the world. Only it's cut off at one end, and then you see the time stream coming out of the particle collider. Yeah. I mean, how unbelievable is that? <laughs> exactly, man. And although, like, although, Joe, surely, surely now, with our quantum kind of mindset that we come from, surely observing that time stream would collapse. Everything. It would have to. Yeah, so they didn't get that one right. But it's good woo. Hey, don't... And again, though, what are they trying to tell us? If it's an infomercial... That's a very good question. And and why did the, why did the portal, why did the... A particle accelerator eerily look like CERN. I mean, almost identical, only yeah. a sc- kind of scaled down, you know, guys? And it's kind of part of the ritual, isn't it, that they use to actually put things under your nose without you hoping, hoping that you don't notice all this subliminal imagery and uh, the things they just sneak in there. I think I heard something to the effect of uh, the things they do don't have any power unless they actually show us what they're doing, and it can even be in a subliminal way. Plus, we can even go quantum with it as well, because if they sow the seed in enough people's subconscious, we are literal creators of our reality. So possibly we're helping to manifest the magic that they're trying to spin around us in the first place. And it gets a bit confusing, Joe. No, there's no doubt they manipulate us. And and another way they do it, <clears throat> since we're talking about uh, quantum electromagnetics and everything else, and I, and I just want to say that this this technology has been out for a very long time. And uh, they're using it for all sorts of different uh, modes and methods, one being mind control, like you were saying, you know. How do they get away with all this stuff? Well, they, they have many ways they go about it. A- another way they can do it, since we're talking about um, quantum, is the neurophone. People are like, what? A neurophone? Why, yes. See, now Tom Bearden wrote about this, and it's very interesting. I didn't know this, and I think you'll find this extremely fascinating. It says, Jesus, let's see. Another <laughs> device it uses, it's hard. This is, this is a mouthful. The new hyperspatial virtual state nested modulation technology and has done so for 17 or 18 years is Dr. Pat Flanagan's Neurophone. It says, with brilliant insight and intuition, far beyond that of any science at the time, Pat invented and patented the instrument by the time he was 17 years old. The Neurophone is a device that, contrary to all present day theory and knowledge, will directly pump the brain and reproduce sound and information directly in the brain and mind system without going through the auditory system at all. A simplified, um, it's a very, it's, it's not really that hard to do. Now, the device briefly takes a, a complex signal, such as the sound of an orchestra playing, a musical interlude, and electrically processes it and um, th- the signal passes into a section that clips everything into a series of square waves. And then remarkably, it, it turns it into like these noisy spikes 
And then it's translated in a virtual state modulation. Did you get that, Kev? Oh, kind of like the harp signals we're supposed to have been doing. Okay, now, now I'm so that's awesome that you said that. So maybe not so much harp, but have you ever heard of the Russian woodpecker signal? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't have the soundboard of you, Joe, but I tried. Hey, it you awesome. sounded really like a, a Russian woodpecker there. A Russian, no. like Woody, Woody of woodpecker. No, I don't know how. I, I, I don't. I don't know if it was exact. No, back the Soviet woodpecker signal is something that ham radio operators for years since the '60s have heard. Um, it went offline briefly during the 1980s after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then it was started up again when hostilities between the United the United States and and Russia started to kind of foment again. You know, all the all the language. Well, the woodpecker signal came back. Tom Bearden writes about uh, writes about that. He says, but as I've said, all of this can be used for the detriment of mankind as well as for its benefit. Talking about the Soviet woodpecker signals. Unfortunately, it appears that the Soviet Union and he wrote this back before uh, the Berlin Wall fell. Has chosen to weaponize the effects on a global scale, that being of the um, that being that of the uh, this technology, this neurophone technology. And he says a prime example is the woodpecker signals emanating from the USSR in the five to thirty megahertz region and interfering with communications around the Earth. It says these complex woodpecker signals appear to originate from two or three dozen powerful Soviet transmitters, each with a power estimated as high as 40 megawatts. Now, that's a lot of power, just so you know, especially in RF. The pioneering experimental measurement of these signals by Robert Beck and William Byes have shown just how deadly a potential may be possessed by the signals. These measurements have been performed in uh, Eugene and Portland, Oregon, Los Angeles, California, Huntsville, Alabama, and several, several other locations. And they've been particularly significant on the West Coast and in and around Eugene, Oregon, because of the presence of a direct current transmission line several hundred mile, miles long, which has acted as a long wire antenna, picking up the signals and rebroadcasting them with appreciable gain in the vicinity. Typically, the signals may be found on, say, 16 different carriers between 10 and 20 megahertz. Twelve of these carriers may appear normal with normal sidebands. And the other four may have the carrier and both sidebands suppressed, but still show the biologically significant modulation, for example, 10 hertz. On, a, on all 16 channels, a strong 10 hertz modulation may appear, all perfectly time synchronized and in phase channel to channel. The receive the received signals from one of these carriers may be 25 to 30 times as strong as the Earth's background magnetic field, which is oscillating at between 7 and 7.5 hertz. Other complex modulated frequencies, uh, many of them changing, are present on the various channels. Now, normally, the brainwaves of mammals in an area are gently entrained by the normal oscillations of the Earth's magnetic field and are oscillating at along 7.5 hertz. Under continuous radiation from Soviet woodpecker signals, uh, 30%, um, say a percentage, of the mammalian brains may be captured by the 10 hertz modulation on the overpowering Soviet signals. These captured brains are now in forced oscillation and are riding along in phase with the 10 hertz Soviet signal. In other words, a certain percentage of human brains in an area will phase lock to the 10 hertz modulation, and that will effectively lock into those brains the 16 carrier frequencies with their con, uh, comitant uh, frequency mixes and complex signal modulations. If the signals are made much more powerful, for example, by focusing them onto one particular area or increasing the power of the transmitters, then a much higher percentage of brainwave entrainment can be accomplished in the targeted area. 
By simply adding on the desired modulation patterns, the Soviets can now pump material directly into the mind, brain, consciousness, life loops of the entrained brains. The weapons implications are enormous. Raw emotions such as sheer terror or panic can be transmitted. Death or disease patterns of all kinds can be transmitted. Informational content, thoughts and ideas can be impressed directly into the captured brains and minds and pro processed as if originating inside each brain itself. How heavy is that, guys? Oh, I love it, man. But you're talking there about, was it 10 hertz, Joe? <laughs> 10 hertz. That, it yeah, that's... Here, when it talks about neural oscillation, I just dug this up and I find this quite kind of, it ties in. It says the first discovered and best known frequency band is the alpha activity. And it says 8 to 13 hertz. And it goes on to say that this can be detected from the occipital lobe during relaxed wakefulness and increased when the eyes are closed. And that suggests to me it kind of put you into a lucid kind of dreaming state almost. Wow. That's, I'm telling you, it all ties together, buddy. This is, I mean, this is huge. And then we had Nano on the show the other night. She was talking about something called Scanners. Now, this is a new kind of concept of a movie that's coming out where <laughs> this sounds totally sci-fi, but it's real. You basically, with your subconscious, write the movie. <laughs> I knew there'd be silence at that one. Absolutely. Your thought pattern and the fact that they now have mapped all the neural pathways in the brain from what wow. I could make out from Nano, that goes into a computer, and then that determines... Yes, that determines the outcome of your film. It's a quantum film, Joe. Dude, it's a quantum film! I'll get the link for this, guys. It's called Scanners. So, yeah, check that out. But basically, you write the ending. Forget that you read what the ending is. You write it. <laughs> wow. That is... <laughs> I gotta see that, dude. That's unbelievable. But the, the, now, I, I just want to be clear. He was writing about this stuff in the 80s, and this technology was being employed since the 60s. Let's just put that in perspective and then say, wow, if he was writing about the neurophone and the, and the Russian woodpecker signal has been going now for well over 50 years. So where are they now? You know what I mean? I, I I say the technology, the advancement of technology, you can no longer measure in years because of how far ahead I think they are. It's just, it's unbelievable. I, I, I can't... Uh, and, and of course, all of this technology has beneficial... Um, can be beneficial to humanity. If it's used in the correct way. But guys, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm not too impressed with humanity up to now. And I don't foresee humanity uh, getting any better. As a matter of fact, I see us really degenerating right now. And could that be a result of the employment of this technology? What do you think? Yeah, it really could. I mean, it seems to be that all the guys with the money have all the technology, and it seems to be in this world that they've made like this way. It's money's power and all that kind of thing. So I can see where the people kind of feel helpless, but I think uh, with enough numbers and uh, enough education of the masses to what's really going on, maybe we can avert some of this stuff and actually use the technology for good. Absolutely. Um, hey, Kevo, or Johnny. What do you think, buddy? I like butterflies. Oh, I do too. And <laughs> unicorns. Like, I like the, the wee wings. And when you look at the wings under a microscope, it looks like fish scales. And then when you look at the fish scales under the microscope, it looks like fish scales. So butterflies should be fish. <laughs> wow, I think somebody just... Uh... Somebody just uh, yeah. somebody go in for maintenance, dude. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> wow. 
this happens. I, I get I, sad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guys, I was telling you about this new technology, right? Where basically you write the end of your own movie. Well, I've got you a clip. You suck, you jackass. Check out this. From talkies and Technicolor to 3D and motion seats, cinema is always looking for the next big thing. Now an experimental short film lets the viewer influence what happens on screen via their brainwaves. Called Scanners, the system uses a wireless headset that reads brainwaves, allowing the user to subconsciously manipulate the film's structure. Scanners is a film platform that uses live data uh, from people's brains uh, to cut and mix a film uh, where, where you have a, an effect loop, a two-way effect loop, whereby watching the film, you change it and it changes you. It uses an EEG headset to read the wearer's brainwaves. A sensor on the forehead picks up muscular and brainwave data, while one on the earlobe reads muscular information. With this, the processor inside the headset can separate the muscular data to isolate and identify all the various brainwaves. In the case of scanners, it's the alpha brainwaves they're interested in, important for creativity and meditation. The film, with a 15-minute runtime, needed proportionately far more footage for all the variations that each viewer could bring to it. So rather than making a linear film, we made a film that was much more quantum and we were able to show what's happening inside somebody's mind, what's happening in their, like, almost their, their imagination. Scanners was recently field tested in a caravan converted into a cinema, with curious passers by asked to step inside and give it a try. Each time I watch someone else um, create the film, um, they make new jumps that I've not seen before. It's unlikely that a similar system could prove viable at your local multiplex. But Ramchand says a similar system could give neuroscientists a better glimpse into the subconscious and allow them to make detailed recordings of dreams. <laughs> Quantum wow, movies. that was freaking wild, man. I told you, you see, I bet there was people out there going, nah, he's making this one up. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Quantum wow. movies, Joe. Quantum movies. And now, now, like, I... I so does that tie to, you know how that they just did the, in the almost akin to the double slit experiment? Um, it was like the double slit and then with another slit. With particles. Yes. Yeah, but with, with particles, right? And st- uh, what was it? They were, no, atoms. It, they were doing it with atoms, like a larger particle, an atom. And the interesting thing about it was it changed its state based on future events. It ran backwards. Like, it, its decision point wasn't based on the past. Like, ooh, we learned from the past. Particles learn from the future. And I was like, whoa, really? That's quantum. You know? That's cool. That is quantum, dude. <laughs> oh, what a way to almost finish the show. This has been wild. But Marty, can you imagine going to the cinema and literally making the film up as you go. I don't know about you, man, but my movie would be pretty messed up. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, definitely mine too. It is crazy, though, to think that this whole transhumanism thing and man merging with computers is really just around the corner. I mean, look at these headsets and these uh, neural network interfaces that they're working on, and they're actually talking about making computers like that one day. So I think maybe... Sometime in the near future, maybe not so near, but it wouldn't surprise me, but we could see things like the mouse and keyboard be obsolete. Uh, You just put on your headset and think, and it will type or do anything you want. (laughs) Crazy stuff. I I think this thing is going to cause a lot of fights in the cinemas because you could just imagine it. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) But the guy's got a gun, and then somebody shouts out, Oh! Who's thinking, don't shoot him? You know what I mean? <laughs> That'd have to be a Forget the glue that holds the universe together, eh? It's the glue that holds Freaky Friday together. You really are, Whistles. Yes, you are, buddy. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, superb. 
you need to laugh in this world, especially some of the topics we've gone over tonight. But I don't know about you guys on the panel. I hope all the audience enjoyed it half as much as I did. Oh, I certainly did. And folks, don't forget, a week from tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, midnight in the U.K., Clifford Carnicom from the Carnicom Institute. Going to be our guest next week. So you want to mark that on your calendars. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a good one. I mean, talk about it being exciting uh, to have the guy that really broke the chemtrail thing wide open come on the air and, and discuss that and Morgellons, which in and of itself, that disease has a ton of woo. I mean, that is like the woo disease of death. I mean, seriously, if you want a death by woo, that that's what it is. And, and hey, you know, speaking of woo, we learn from the best. Chris and Cherie Geo coming up next. So you don't want to miss that. So there's so much good radio here at TFR. Damn it. All day long. What do you say, guys? Oh, the Woo Express just keeps chugging along. It certainly it does. does. <laughs> it certainly does. And it's great, you know? It, it is. It's great. Friday night. Oh, Joe, when I think about this kind of show, this is the kind of show I would have absolutely loved when I was just starting to wake up. It's always all the best topics. We won't give them any of the answers, but at least we can make people think about some of the more interesting stuff that's around. Take us away from the kind of five cents 3D reality madness that myself, Marty, and Johnny have to do night in and night out. <laughs> and I just and I cannot stress more, folks. Support D's nuts in 2016. Thank right. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic show, guys. Fantastic show, yeah. Stand by. Chris and Cherie Geo coming up next. And remember, folks, wherever you are, make a TFO. D's nuts. Two. <laughs> <laughs>